OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. It's half past seven on this Friday morning. You're welcome along to OTB AM. Owen and Adrian with you right away through until 10 o'clock this morning. And over the course of the next two and a half hours, we're going to be building up to the weekend's GAA action. We're going to be looking ahead to the first test of the British and Irish Lions Tour in South Africa. And of course, we will be chatting about the Olympics throughout the morning as well. Because, Adrian, it is day zero of the Olympics to give it its technical title. Have you caught Tokyo fever, a desperate dose of Tokyo fever just yet? Not really. Um, I was just thinking there, it's probably a good time, a good insight for you on over the next few weeks to uh, feel like what it's what it's like to be a parent. That okay. You have to get up at all sorts of hours of the morning and, uh, and tend to your passion. Does parenting involve the option to say, now I'll just stay in bed and catch up <laughs> the parenting on RTE Player later on? It's a it depends on how uh, <laughs> it depends on how sympathetic your uh, your partner is on. Okay, I see. That's good. That's a short answer. To good that. life advice. This is this is a good dad cast training ground basically the next couple of weeks. Well, you can toggle it. You can toggle in and out. So you could get up uh, last night to watch the rowing. Then I mm. could get up tonight to watch the taekwondo, and you could sort of toggle in and out. And then you could sort of give each other updates to you know make sure nobody's missed out on anything. I like this. I like this. That uh, this is this is sharing the load here quite considerably. You did you didn't get up to watch the rowing last night, is what I'm gathering here. No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, like it's going to be a struggle, isn't it? Like it's it's going to be big medal possibilities. Certainly, some of the rowing some of the boxing that's going to get you out of the scratcher, but um, I think it's going to be a struggle for an Irish audience. I think it's going to be a lot of catch-up. I think so, but also we live in a modern society where we can watch all this stuff back. It's not like, mm. oh, you're, you're going to miss the moment necessarily. Yeah. I get it. I get it if there's a medal you want, you want, or it's a final, I should say. You want to be watching that thing live, but when it comes to the Roars last night, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't want to inject any arrogance into our, our, the Irish rowing team just yet, but it is just heats at this point, and especially with someone like uh, Sunita Paspure, uh, you're like, OK, there will be other opportunities, hopefully, for her to, to race in bigger in bigger events. Now, in fairness, you would have thought that about the, the men's pair as well last night and things didn't necessarily go their way. But you were catching up on it this morning. Yeah, uh, the the uh, first race, particularly Sunita Paspore, is like it was so straightforward for her, wasn't it? Like it was an ideal one, really, to get her into the quarterfinals. She eight seconds ahead, something like that at the end. And it is going to have, the games are going to have those peaks and troughs. And the point been made regularly in commentary that in 2012, she was the only boat there. And suddenly we're going there. It just shows you how quickly a sport like that can turn around. And it's not like as if it's turned around overnight. There's obviously a lot of hard work that's going on, um, particularly with the Donovans and others. But... Um, yeah, it's incredible sort of level of uh, not even just the volume, but then the level of athlete we have competing um, in the rowing. But yeah, really good start for her. Less so for the lads. You were watching that one. They they just didn't really go their way. But they have another chance. Is it you were saying tomorrow? Or yeah, shortly coming up. Repechage tomorrow morning for Ronan Byrne and Philip Doyle. Uh, cracker of a heat, really. If you're neutral watching this one, mm. Switzerland and New Zealand. Both looked pretty threatened by Ireland at relative times. I mean, I'm sure Bernard Doyle would have suggested beforehand that they were targeting one of the top three places. It was a four-boat race. Top three progressed to the next round. The fourth boat go into the repechage. So there was no huge jeopardy, obviously, or a massive advantage if you don't have to go through the, the, the repechage. And they would have liked to have done that. But still, there is a, another opportunity for them. But you did think at one point during the race, right, they have the Swiss on the rack here and then they managed to kick on. And then in the last... I want to say 250 metres, they had New Zealand on the rack and they also pushed on at the end and uh, the, the Polish boat didn't really look like they were under any threat at any point. Even just by a, a quick glance over the competing nations that tend to do really well in rowing, their heat, for example, was a much tougher heat than the one that Sunita was in. But then by the same token, Sunita would be, uh, I guess, of a, of a higher standard relative to her competitors than, than the two lads as well. You would expect them to maybe progress from the, the repechage tomorrow from everything you're reading before the game started. They were seen as a, an outside shout of of potentially contending uh, at this Olympics. So tomorrow morning, they'll, they'll probably be in, in the must-watch territory. But Sunita, just incredible. D- dominant by name, dominant by uh, nature. Just a, an, an incredible, <laughs> incredible performance. And um, like what, what, what we're going to see over the next little while is when more of those traditional rowing countries go up against her, uh, how is she relative to them? Because I think there's, there's, there is this, this question mark about Sunita at the Olympic Games. Things just have not gone her way either when qualifying for Olympics or actually at the Olympic Games. And obviously all her success has come away from the biggest moments uh, of her career or the biggest moments for any uh, Olympian's career. 
well, I go on, you're touching something there, and I think that um, here's us like thinking about, you know, poor all us sort of having to get up in the middle of the night just to watch the games and sort of report back in them and talk about them the next morning. But somebody spare a thought for what you assume is going to be an unbelievably busy Department of Sport over the next little while. Consider the amount of civil servants <laughs> currently drafting and reworking and rewording and, you know, pulling in quotes from Jack Chambers in the department at the minute in terms of the various possibilities with the games over the next few months I, I let's somebody feel a little bit of sympathy for those civil servants in the department <laughs> I, uh, I, I I for one do feel sympathy like the, the, the question is does Jack Chambers does Catherine Martin have the ability to go full Shane Ross over the next little while can they do it can they outdo Shane Ross the, the answer is, is no obviously because Shane Ross was right there uh, with Annalise Murphy when she won her silver medal in the last Olympic Games mm. uh, and actually uh, there, there won't be any uh, f- physical photo opportunity but there is always the airport uh, when, when they yeah. do come home with their medals to, to be there and uh, to, to get those opportunities uh, tomorrow then you're really looking forward to, to the taekwondo Adrian is that, am I right in saying that? <laughs> the the, <laughs> the phrase is that the Olympic bingo has really been ticked off here. We've already done repechage on this. is the first time, and congratulations, I've heard it for uh, the 2021 games. I don't know what we're calling them, uh, Tokyo 2020. Um, and uh, certainly I'm looking forward to the Tokyo, uh, the Taekwondo is definitely another one of those. I'm looking forward to it because I saw a really good show on the telly the other night, which um, had a big focus on Jack Woolley. And he's such a brilliant story such a brilliant young man and uh, just the fact that he he had almost made it at such a young age, I don't know, was he just 17 when he had almost made it to Rio, got within touch and distance of it and just missed out and he was absolutely devastated, sort of like it's that story where he went back to um, hone his trade. Thought then that he had qualified via one of the qualifiers for Tokyo for 24 hours before somebody said to him, no, actually that hasn't fully qualified you and sorry about that but you're dependent now on I don't know is it Russia versus Mexico the Russia needs to win that and uh, if he does then you're in and if he doesn't then you're out and uh, it was it was an incredible turn of events really um, and as I really really well told in that um, Horizon Tokyo it was called Andy Lee the narrator well we're checking out um, and it, there is that thing I think about the games as well on like there's so many of these athletes whose stories were really well attuned to like some of the more high profile boxers some of the rowers that we've been talking about, but there are like several stories outside of that. The biggest team we've ever had, what is it, 116? So needless to say, there's plenty of those athletes that we'd have known not, not, nothing about or not very much about before the games begin uh, began. Jack Woolley has been sort of bubbling along in the background, but um, his story is a brilliant one and I'm really looking forward to seeing how he gets on. And you were just saying off air before we, before we came on, it seems like he is a bit of a medal hope as well, which is... Um, which is incredible, and it's a big pressure for him. But yeah, really looking forward to him, and, and hope he can uh, hope he can deliver something. The way that Taekwondo is working as well tomorrow is that it'll start in the dead of the night. But if you believe in Jack Woolley enough, you can set your alarm for much later, and just just hope that he's still uh, still in the competition when you actually uh, do wake up uh, the, t- tomorrow morning. So um, that'll be interesting. Like uh, for example, you look at the quarterfinals if he makes it that far that's on a quarter past six in the morning and then the semi-finals are on at quarter past eight in the morning so if he gets to the business end you don't need to get up at the ridiculously early time of 2.15 or stay up uh, for his uh, elimination rounds early on so so that's his thing tomorrow well, what's what's your go-to sport do you not have like a, a go-to like what is what is the a, 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 like the expertise that Adrian Barry brings to proceedings in these <laughs> opening days like archery is the one that most people go for are, are, are really? you one of those cliched people yeah, what? like just because it's an early, it's an early Olympics event. For the shooting as well seems to get a lot of people going oh. because, like, my my thing, my big thing on the Olympics is, and now in fairness, I did watch Brazil against Germany yesterday. Is if you're watching soccer or golf or tennis, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. I mean, we we get enough of this stuff all year round, especially the soccer. If you're watching the soccer especially the, 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 the men's football when it's not traditionally a big thing whatsoever. What are you doing? Go and flick over to something that you're not going to watch again for another, in this case, three years because you will get enough of Richarlison on match of the day in about four or five weeks' time when he inevitably misses two sitters in the Merseyside derby. That is when you can watch your Richarlison. You do not need to see him score three goals against Germany in an Olympic game. And that goes for every men's footballer taking part in this thing. It is a waste of everybody's time. So... What what is your non traditional or your your relatively niche sport that you'll be picking? They're not really that relatively niche, but I I did row a little bit when I was younger, so I do right. 
tend to keep it, keep an eye out for that. I was I was terrible. I was the bowman in an eight, so that's pretty much the worst roar that you can get. Where, and, where is your analysis uh, this morning on on the, on our tree roars then? At. I've been out of the boat for a while, on so I'm gonna I'm gonna reserve uh, <laughs> I'm gonna reserve analysis of that. Um, uh, yeah, and as I said, I was brutal when I was at it anyway. But and look, it's not far from niche. But the only Olympic sport I was ever at was boxing. Um, Katie Taylor in London 2012, and like we have such a history of um, doing so well in the ring that like it's nearly a bit cliche but definitely the boxing is the other one that I keep an eye on and look at you become an expert in all these sports don't you like you become a 48 hour a 24 hour expert in all these sports that you pay absolutely no heed to um, or not much for the rest of the year and everybody sort of knows the ins and outs I remember Annalise Murphy at the couple of games she was at and everybody was like I can't believe on the downwind she didn't take the inside line and <laughs> try to catch the Brazilian on the, it's like uh, I mean and then afterwards you're like what was what was that about Yeah. Um, so yeah what about you I, I don't know. I, I usually kind of am a, very much a floating voter uh, on a lot of these things. Always keen to watch any new sport at any games ever. I, I do think it's like quite timely that karate is here in Japan, the country that literally invented the game. I always find that there's like a massaging of the medal count sometimes to get these events in. But like outside of that, I think skateboarding is what a lot of people are going to to, to watch with the, the popcorn out because nobody has a clue how to judge it. But as you say, people will become experts very, very quickly. Also, what I find with these is that we will be projected onto us quite a, a great view from the, the, the British media on their superstars. And in skateboarding, they have their youngest ever Olympian uh, going in this, Sky Brown. She is 13 years of age. She just t- turned 13. She's representing Great Britain uh, in Olympic skateboarding. Naturally, there's been tons of features written about her over the last few months, had life-threatening injuries after a skateboarding accident last year. And naturally, as you can imagine, her parents weren't exactly inclined to uh, encourage the, the skateboarding career too much, but she managed to win that argument, is competing, is going to go into that. And uh, you'd imagine that uh, it will become uh, a hugely covered story on the BBC over the next little while. Like, you can't not watch the gymnastics once it gets underway. Mm-hmm. Simone Biles, yesterday in practice by all accounts, pulling off a move that nobody's ever pulled off in competition in gymnastics. And then experts are saying that she doesn't even need to pull off that incredible move to actually win all the gold medals she's supposed to win, such as her dominance. She will become the most decorated gymnast of all time if she wins all the gold medals she's competing for this time. And then there's the the, the superstars in the swimming pool. Like we've got bad news this morning that Shane Ryan has had to pull out of one of his events uh, due to injury, which isn't great. But on an international level, like he, I see the Los Angeles Times have an article on Caleb Dressel on the precipice of becoming the next Michael Phelps. And I, I was waiting for this. I was waiting for the, 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 the slew of Caleb Dressel is Michael Phelps articles to come because this guy is the next American Aquaman and he is the guy that they're pinning their hopes on to, to win seven medals, actually, is he's, he's what he's going for over the next couple of weeks. So, so he'll be the man to watch in the pool. But as I say, I'll probably just end up watching hours and hours of archery on loop and then followed by table <laughs> tennis. And, uh, and that'll and, be me, happy. Sorry, and commit yourself to, God, I'm going to go and do some archery at some point because that looks like a sport <laughs> I could really... But, like, I mean, we do... Is Derek Burnett, Burnett is there. He's been, like, he's been competing since the 50s. Yeah. He'll probably go on to compete until, like, 2078. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 you know, one of those sports that you don't necessarily... There's not a window. Like, I mean, some of the names that you've mentioned there, even Simone Biles feels like she's been around for years. She's probably still only about 22. Um, the archery is one of those ones you can literally be 114 and still sort of wheel yourself out and away you go. I can just hear the the, the archery community of the world uh, <laughs> putting Adrian Barry up on their dartboard right now. I, That's a, the, I might be ex- I might be exaggerating. I mean, I did, surely of all of all the sports to not have a dartboard. Yeah, well, that's a it's a very good point actually <laughs> on the archery board. Um, all, all like I mean the, the the other thing as well is the the USA men's basketball team is the one that everybody kind of gets into every four years, and they're playing at one o'clock on Sunday Irish time. So very good time to watch them play France. I was going to say smash France, but things haven't been going perfectly for them over the last little while, so they might have a few difficulties uh, in that one. And um, sure, we'll be back here next week looking ahead to some of the, the track and field superstars over the next little while. And we'll come back to that, of course, with Phil Egan in just a few moments to, to check in on what happened over the course of the night and what to look forward to over the next little while. But one of the other big stories of last night was in the GAA and in the Leinster Under-20 final between Offaly and Dublin. It was finally a Leinster decider victory for Offaly. An unbelievable outpouring of emotion at the full-time whistle. It was brilliant to see. And this was all part of it. This was Cormac Egan 
who was chatting to TG Cahar, picking up his Man of the Match award last night. Can you even start to try to put that into words? No, not really. You know, it's, uh, it's been a long time coming and awfully. Uh, you know, we had the minors lens the final there only a few weeks ago. We lost, you know, we're so close, a point away. And just to come here today, we only joined the panel only two weeks ago before the Expo game. And, you know, just to come here today and put on that performance with the boys, you know, they're really a credit. Each round one of them is a credit to their family and, and this team. It could not have gone better, could it? I mean, despite the fact that you conceded the three goals, it was just, I mean, an incredibly passionate, skillful, and determined and disciplined performance by Offaly. Yeah, like it was it was what Offaly football is about, what it was built on in, in the 70s, day. He's all the way up, you know, boys with granddads and, and even older who had played in them great Offaly teams, you know. And we thought we had to reinstill that back into this team, you know, the boys Raf, Deck and all the boys in the back from Team Cohen, they really put that into us. And that's that's as much them as it is us. You know, they've drilled that into us from the very start, you know. From underage, Ken, Ken Furlong with the minors, you know, Tony Dalton, Ginger Stewart, all these boys coming up along. And this this is what it is here for the, today. You know, it's it's more than just this team. It's teams that have gone by that maybe didn't get over the line. This is for them. You weren't even around the last time after they won this title. <laughs> You've got the cup to collect. Well done, Mahu. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Yeah, incredible. This guy's my new favourite footballer, Adrian. Mm. The mullet, is it? The ginger hair that both you and I have some sympathy with? Oh, yeah. Like This is this gives hope to all of us that uh, we, we, we do have uh, an ability to, to have nice hair. That That is that is like the best hairstyle right now in Irish sport. And he's got incredible pace. He's got the gift of the gab. I just love that. I don't know what it, what it is about it. Like, there's been so many... Mm brilliantly passionate interviews and even in the, the last couple of weeks like even Keith Ricken with the Cork Under 20s last week was just a, a brilliant post-match interview we're well accustomed to hearing people really spill their heart out after a great win and it was, there was just something special about the way that kid did it or there was something really likeable about it almost you could kind of feel his, his sense of history or his knowledge of history or he could perfectly appreciate just how significant that win was for not just for, for Offaly at underage level but for Offaly as a whole and for Leinster football as a whole Yeah well you get used to listen to the post-match interviews at typically sort of more senior levels to that where it's just cliches and in a Leinster context it's Dublin teams talking about something that everybody knows they couldn't give two hoots about ultimately having won uh, so many of them over the last 15 years but yeah he was he it was it was a great interview and I think that a lot of the pouring uh, outpouring last night on that you were talking about I think like on the pitch and at the venue, I don't think much of that was related to the bigger picture because obviously there was just that microcosm of the celebration of a team that had beaten Dublin and beaten them fairly comprehensively. A 3-3 three, three for for any team to score uh, on the Dublin side was so low scoring, really. Like, um, obviously they were pretty ruthless with taking their goals, but six scores over the course of a game is is uh, is pretty brutal. And you have to take your hat off to Offaly on that. But yeah, I do think a big part of the outpouring was also in terms of the reaction to it from the broader GEA community last night was like, you know, um, first time since 2018, since Dublin haven't won the Leinster under 20s. It's, they've won six, including last night, they've won six of the last eight. So, I mean, that just gives you a bit of a sense of how, how down they are. And maybe it's just a sign that, you know, everybody around the country could get behind that because... It means that the conveyor belt isn't exactly maybe like we thought it was. And I don't think anybody sort of thinks or assumes that Offaly is going to go on and dominate the game. Maybe this crop come through, as he was saying, they were in a month, uh, minor final as well, not that long ago. Maybe there's a whole pile of players out of this crop that comes through and, and um, can kick them on a bit on, on senior level. But yeah, I think a lot of it was dancing on the grave of the dubs. Yeah, like I, I think that there's only so much you can read into that for for future Dublin teams and, and all that sort of stuff. But but like what you want to see is not so much. Uh, well, I think anyway for for me anyway, it's not so much the the grave being danced on, but the, the these upshoots. Like, and I think that awfully have been one of the the really good GA stories in general all year. They, they may not say football wise. Obviously, they may not have got the headlines. Somebody like Derry would have gotten, and Vernon Derry did beat them well in a, in a league final but they were a team that showed that they could take a few steps forward after a difficult few years and I mean they've like when it comes to their, their, their hurlers as well it's not been a bad year overall so like this is this, this is the sort of stuff you want to see when things start to look a little bit hopeless and 
in both codes. They've had massive struggles over over the last few years, and just to see some sort of joy once again in in that county, a county that has so much tradition, I think is is a massively positive news story right now. Yeah, you had to kind of looking at the celebrations last night. You had to sort of remind yourself that uh, there is still a pandemic at play. You were like, oh, this is this is great, it's like one of these old TG card games. Oh no, that's that's live. But yeah, and I was definitely. I'm not going to lie. It was like my first thought. On seeing the result last night was ah oh, damn it we uh, Westmead were so close to um that could have been Westmead on was mm. my was my major thought but look um you move past your selfish uh, thoughts in these things and yeah hopefully like you just everybody needs the senior thing to get a bit more competitive and like if it's awfully that can step forward with that crop of players and put it up to them like I you know without wandering into the conversation about have the dubs come back to the pack, which I believe they definitely have. Um, yeah, hopefully it's it bodes well for, uh, I mean, and again, as a neighbouring county, I say it with, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a comment that I might regret down the track, but it does bode well and good luck to them. We're going to have Alan Quinlan with us at around five past eight this morning, but one of the big stories ahead of the first test of the British and Irish Lions um, tour is the appointment of the TMO tomorrow, Adrian. This is something that is supposedly causing Warren Gatland much consternation right now. Warren Gatland is said to be furious, writes the opening line of Owen Slot's piece on the back of the London Times. Marius Yonker, uh, the 53-year-old former policeman, uh, will be the TMO tomorrow. He's a South African. He, uh, The TMO for all three tests was supposed to be Brendan Pickerel from New Zealand, but because of COVID, he hasn't been able to travel. And the Lions only discovered on Wednesday that Yonker has been drafted in to replace him. As far as I'm aware, Gatland hasn't done media since Wednesday, so I think he, maybe he hasn't spoken publicly about this just yet. Apologies if I'm wrong on that, but I do believe that today in his final press conference will be the first time we hear him talk about this, so that should be pretty good. But Yonker was the guy who was TMO for the game against the South Africa A team last week, which is just another little bit of oil to douse the flames when it comes to what Warren Gatlin might say a little bit later on because as we know Gatlin was quite unhappy with the TMO's inaction or inability to, to further punish Faf de Klerk and the supposed head-to-head contact that, that Gatlin saw. So he's not going to be happy Yeah, I think it's fair to say Adrian. Well it's classic Warren Gatlin on <laughs> let's face it isn't it I mean there's always there has to be something uh, he's got to stir the pot. He said as much about us when he was over the roadshow a couple of years ago. He's got to keep that pot stirred. Got to keep the war of words going. Um, and I think that's what's going on here because I think <clears throat> the TMO, of course, is not ideal. You would want somebody there who's not a South African or not an um, interested party, let's say. But it is a bit of a red herring, isn't it? I mean, you know, the of all the roles to fulfil at a sporting occasion... To suggest, which is ultimately what he's saying, that because he's South African, he might have some sort of a sway and a leaning and a bias towards making decisions that are favourable towards South Africa. Okay, if you're a referee in the 90s where you have no TMO or you're a football referee in the 2000s where there's no VAR and you can sort of get away with a decision and keep your head down and say, well, look, and hopefully, you know, no one's going to know. It's not the case. Like the TMO, we're all going to pour over those replays 15 times and this is going to be absolutely in the spotlight as to whether this guy's making a good or a bad call like those calls happen uh those bad calls can happen with the tmo anyway i just don't believe that i'm not buying it for a second that marius jonker is going to be in any way biased as a as a tmo in that game i just can't see it it's his reputation on the line as well basically yeah of course like and and like the entire like, you'd almost suggest, and look, this is probably exactly why Gatlin's making the comments. You'd almost suggest he'll probably go slightly the other way because he needs to be whiter than white. I, I really can't see a situation where, given the nature of that very specific role, and like I said, of course you would you would want somebody else doing it. And that's why officials tend to not come from the countries that are involved. But having said that, I think of all the roles in sport that you could think about to possibly have somebody there and it's obviously happening for COVID reasons that him being from South Africa for me is just a total non-issue Just more, more from the Owen Slot piece Yonker used to be an international referee he retired to the TMO booth in 2014 his son Reinhardt is a professional rugby player for the Cell Sea Sharks where his teammates include Sia Khaleesi the Springboks captain I wonder who Warren Gatlin might blame if it's a very tight game tomorrow in the aftermath 
Well, he can only do that if there's a controversial call on the team or gives it that way. But again, like I think you're given reasons as to why Marius Jonker is probably going to go slightly the other way. Like, he, <laughs> like you say, his reputation is absolutely on the line if there's any question mark about this thing. And he's to sit down with his bosses on Monday and say, here's why he made that call. And they're going to go, well, I mean, we know that, you know, we read the own slap piece. Um, <laughs> he's going to have to say, well, look, at the evidence is there that that's not true. It's like, it's it's in a lot of ways, it's a fairly outrageous thing to say isn't it you know like to question um uh, yonkers um credentials here and as i said i just think it's look at this this series <clears throat> and that's this is really that that rivalry between him and erasmus is going to take on it's already been bubbling away beautifully as you pointed out during the week but whichever one of them ends up on the losing side um a draw notwithstanding uh whichever one ends up on the losing side tomorrow night they are going to crank this into the red zone. Maybe not directly after the game, but there'll be something during the week. Both of them, have, as you said, have have loads of... Uh, we've evidence of both of them um, um, blowing the lid, and that's what's going to happen here if uh, whichever one of them ends up on the losing side. Nothing quite stokes the rivalry quite like a series. You really need a series, don't you, just to, to try and ratchet things up, that you get it quite often in, in the NBA where teams just build up a real hate for one another because they've got to go a number of games against each other and it does seem maybe during the Lions tour that we do get more of this sort of stuff and I'm not saying that the tension has reached fever pitch or anything like that but as you point out and I agree with you that this could reach a whole new level over the next couple of weeks and it's only because there's another two games that are going to happen after this week and it was the same with, with Gatland and, and New Zealand and, and their press four years ago that this these teams becoming well accustomed to one another and well acquainted with one another just allows things to be ratcheted up as as the weeks go on and it's a beautiful thing really I'm I'm really looking forward to this over the next little while and hopefully for that reason you go into the final test one game apiece one win apiece and that that final week will be uh, on an even higher level of tension Uh, yeah it's Sorry, it's like it. it's like it's like a tennis match almost on in some ways in that like you know tennis goes on for so long and ultimately it boils down to a couple of little points and I think that there's a similar dynamic of player a couple of comments by the way that are in on that discussion just mm-hmm. on YouTube there one from Alan Alan O'Neill saying uh, lads the reason you don't ref your own country is because of unconscious bias it's not because a ref might do it on purpose and Peter Roach says Adrian are you crazy it's totally inappropriate to have a South African TMO do you think he's likely to highlight any South African foul play that the referee misses and I would definitely <clears throat> counter that Peter and thanks for getting in touch that to say that I think that he will be on his toes and I think that he can't uh, like it. it is it's not I'm not suggesting that this is a great idea to have to get into a policy where you have TMOs or officials from home countries, although it has happened a lot more, obviously, over the last 18 months as COVID has dictated, which is exactly the reason that this is happening as well. Um, I just believe that he specifically on the game tomorrow is going to be acutely conscious and, uh, you know, on a very conscious level that he can't put a foot wrong. That'd be my view on it. What about poor Reinhardt? Like, won't somebody think of the child in, in all of this and the fact that he has to walk into a Celsi Sharks dressing room after all of this and his father's after, I don't know, picking out Faf de Clark for going clerk for head, going head to head with, with somebody in the middle of a game. I mean, poor, poor Reinhardt yeah. here. They, they, like, you got to think about, about those sort of unconscious biases as well. Like, you've kind of, like, before the show, I was kind of like in disagreement with you and you kind of like won me over with your argument there as well. Like, if I was in his shoes, I would definitely be uber conscious of the fact that this would be said about me and these things will be written and it, it things will be said this afternoon for example at the press conference but at the same time I can see the the, the point that that first commenter made there. there it is an unconscious thing yeah but but my point is that he, that's not going to come into it because he's going he's to be consciously G- Gatlin's words right are going to and this is he's, he's achieved everything he wanted but for me it's a Oh, jeez, I'm just pulling my own little <laughs> studio here apart. I'm so passionate about this one. Uh, uh, for me, like, the whole point was that Gatland would um, have his words ringing in the ears of the TMO and of the, and of the match officials. And that's exactly what's happening. I don't actually believe that it's a thing. I don't believe that. I don't think anybody would really be suggesting that the TMO is going to pull uh, a homer decision here. Right. Surely. Well, we're going to get Alan Quinlan's take on that. After 8 o'clock, he's going to have the final say on that. OTBAM, by the way, is brought to you every morning by Gillette. Good mornings. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It is 8 a.m. 
on the button coming up this morning over the next couple of hours. As I say, we are going to be joined by Alan Quinlan in just a moment. After that, the sports page is coming your way at 20 past eight and then the GEA quick picks in the company of Willow Callaghan, who will also be luxuriating in that under 20s win for Offaly last night, coming your way at half past eight. Then from 10 to 9, Breed Stack will be with us to preview the provincial finals at the weekend and also the games in the LGFA. And then the crappy quiz, which is Adrian versus Phil versus Tommy, coming your way at 10 past 9. Brian O'Driscoll is up at half past 9 in conversation with Richie last night, previewing um, the Lions, the first test of the British and Irish Lions. And we're actually going to bring you a clip of that right now. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll, by the way, is also on commentary for OTV Sports uh, for that first test against South Africa. And here is how he sees it going. Yeah, just crazy physical from the off. I, I, I hope that we're not going to have it, you know, manipulated um, in in any way um, through you know through ye- yellow cards or or particularly red cards because I think it's going to be it's not going to be for the faint-hearted. And if someone you know misses a shot or tries to stamp their authority and, and their timing is off, you know, they're going to be gone, and, and that could impact a game significantly, particularly if it happens in the first half an hour or 40 minutes. Um, so I, I feel as though it'll be a bit of a chess match. They'll tease each other out. Um, there'll be penalties given. There'll be penalties kicked. There'll be very little rugby played in one another's half. Um, and then I do feel as though it might be just left to a, a moment of magic, be it a Cheslin or a Stuart Hogg or, a, or a, an Anthony Watson um, to, to, to be the difference. I, I feel as though I've swung around. I thought... South Africa were going to win the series 2-1 but I do think that the Lions might win this first one and really put it up to South Africa so I'm going to go with a Lions victory just by three or four points because I do think over the course of the three games there's there's going to be very little between these two sides. Yeah, Brian O'Driscoll there speaking to Richie McCormick on last night's show. The full piece coming your way at half past nine this morning. And we have got live commentary of every game on the British and Irish Lions Tour of South Africa here and off the ball. And this Saturday, Neil Tracy and Brian O'Driscoll are bringing you live commentary of the first test. Our Lions coverage is brought to you in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. Busy hour ahead here on OTBAM. We'll have our GAA quick picks a little later and Breed Stack will also be with us. We're back after these, we're back after these I should say, uh, talking Lions with Alan Quinlan. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. It's not like it's a competition that's on again next year. You have to wait a full Olympic cycle to go again. Realistically, most of the team aren't going to be here again for the next Olympics, so it's like it's do or die. It's really about who can sort of minimise the mistakes and make the least amount of mistakes and just sail a really smart series. It doesn't stop just at the 100, 200 and 400. We have amazing girls in the 800 metres It's carrying the whole way through and I think that's something that's really important to note. For the best Olympics coverage, subscribe to the OTB Highlights podcast feed on the OTB Sports app now. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so. Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. OTB. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. That anticipation and excitement fuels some people's desires, and you always came across as one of those sort of players. Yeah, and I, I did, Brian, but I probably could have enjoyed it more. I just didn't enjoy it, and I, that's what I think I was affected because of of um, of that pressure uh, I put on myself um, because I was I wasn't being myself. Mm. You know, and that, that was the, the concerning thing for me, so... How did that manifest itself? Is, is that a sleepless night thing? Is it thinking about it? Yeah, Ad nauseum? For what, any what, of the GA followers, it would have been... I, I played an All-Ireland final in 2009, and I remember the Thursday before, and I just... My legs were just gone. I, I wouldn't have been able to walk around the golf course here. I had just gone I, completely mentally. I just put so much pressure and anxiety on myself. I was just... I was just a ball of stress. Um, and that's how it manifests itself. And you know, I was lucky enough I was able to come around for the game itself. But I look back at that period and say, why, you know? Okay. Why, you know? 
Yeah, a snippet there from a really special piece we released yesterday after we brought two of Ireland's greatest sports people together down at Mount Juliet. Brian O'Driscoll and Henry Shefflin played a round of golf and had a chat for OTB Sports. You can check that out in all the usual places. It is absolutely worth your time. Adrian, I forgot to get your prediction earlier on for the British and Irish Lions. We heard Brian O'Driscoll there before the ad break. Call the series before it kicks off tomorrow for us. I'd probably go with his 2-1 prediction. It's hard to see on the basis of the South African A that was really just South Africa the other week. Um, the cobbled together nature of the lines really came to the fore there. And it'll be interesting to talk to Quinny about the, the absence of combinations. It's a big thing that's come out from the uh, from the team news. But it's the one area that you can actually pre-engineer to ha- create a bit more connection between your team and Gatlin's obviously chosen not to do that so it will be interesting to see how that plays out this weekend particularly but I'd probably go 2-1 where the first where the win comes for the Lions like you were saying earlier I really hope it's not the last test that there's still something in it when it's alive but I fear it might be 2-0 going into the last test and maybe end up 2-1 like you just think to yourself 2009 what would have happened had that been one all going into the final test or had the Lions actually won that second test how ferocious that final test uh, would have been I should say Bob Meets Henry was brought to you with thanks to Vodafone team of us you can catch the podcast now on the OTB Sports app unbelievable uh, level of insight there from Henry Shefflin Adrian a brilliant brilliant conversation uh, the the two lads Donovan and Juliet and there's particularly the bit that stood out for me was Henry talking about not that clip but he talked a bit later on about he won't go back he didn't want to manage at senior level in Kilkenny he didn't want to manage um, against Bally Hale and that's why he's taken on an intermediate club but and Brian was kind of uh, prodding him to say, look, you know, people have done it. Uh, Ronan and Gara spoke about, this was Brian was saying that Ronan and Gara spoke about, you know, maybe managing, uh, coaching Leinster, which I'm not sure, um, I'm pretty sure me and Amani was saying, no, not for me. But uh, Henry was really strong and saying, no, uh, I just couldn't do it. That, you know, they're my mates. It's my family. It was a real insight into, you know, Brian obviously isn't, uh, doesn't come from the GA world. And it was a real insight into um, that the, the clash of, of two worlds almost in some ways. For sure. Just going to uh, run you through some of uh, the back pages this morning. It is seven minutes past eight here on OTBAM. We're going to be chatting rugby with Alan Quinlan very shortly. It is that story that I mentioned on the back of the London Times leading the way. Lions furious over South African TMO. It's uh, Warren Gatlin privately. Privately. Uh, supposedly furious at the moment so we wait with bated breath the first public utterances from the Lions camp hopefully this afternoon the Irish examiner leads with setting the table at last Tokyo welcomes the Olympic Games as Adrian mentioned earlier on it is the uh, biggest Irish team ever at an Olympics uh, Ronan O'Gara then says he's hoping Gatlin makes us all like uh, all idiots once again uh, after some of the talk this week critical naturally as there are, there's always going to be criticism of a, of a Lions selection across all the, the relative media and uh, Ronald O'Gara is hoping that Gatlin gets proven correct once again the Irish Independent leads with Tokyo holds its breath as Ireland begin medal quest Tala Taekwondo Ace Woolley the early hope for Olympic success as games begin under cloud and that is a photograph of Jack Bryant of Offaly celebrating their victory over Dublin in last night's Leinster under-20 final. And Pragmatic Box have similar style to Munster, insists Conan, says the headline there. He says he's been speaking to Conor Murray and Tyg Byrne about playing under uh, Razzi Erasmus, uh, about their style, their mindset. It's a good insight. We know how important set piece in the aerial battle is going to be. I think that's the same when you are playing Munster. Uh, the Herald... Long delight for Hero Ross. Bows take lead thanks to Tierney goal ahead of return Euro leg at Aviva. Another great result uh, for Bows last night, winning 1 0 in Doodle Lounge. And Dundalk drew 2 all with Lavadia Tallinn. So uh, mixed enough results for the Irish teams last night in the Europa Conference League, but both teams very much still alive. And uh, there is that Conan story there as well. The Irish Times. Leads with the Olympic Games. We dare not speak of medals yet. Here are some of our biggest prospects, right? Ian O'Reardon, he's gone through to people who have uh, really good hopes and outside hopes of actually picking up some silverware over the next little while. Uh, You've also got Shane Stokes uh, in conversation with uh, Eddie Dunbar, all geared up to make a memorable Olympic debut. The road race is on tomorrow around 6 o'clock Irish time. The sun 
Cash and Harry. City sell their silver to land golden duo. The Irish Mirror goes with PSG. Pogba says goodbye. United star snubs. £50 million new deal with sight set on move to Paris. And you've also got the Bow story there. Uh, Gypsy Kings. Bows secure a vital away win in Luxembourg as Dundalk draw thriller. Ground Pog Day is the headline on the back of the Irish Daily Star. Paul Snubs' new contract as Paris Saint-Germain I United Star. The Irish Daily Mail, meanwhile, goes with Gatland Fury. Lions coach is angered by South African TMO appointment. And then the last couple of ones, the Daily Telegraph. Gatland Fury at home TMO for test series. Lions fear controversial video calls may be pivotal against the box. And South African Yonka replaces Kiwi because of travel disruption. There's also a photograph there of Adam Peaty. Mr. Invincible, they call him. 6 a.m. starts and 2,500 lengths a week. How Peaty became a great untouchable. And then finally, The Guardian goes with the headline saying, A fundamental right. Dina Asher-Smith urges games to allow podium protests. But at 11 minutes past 8 on this Friday morning, delighted to welcome Alan Quinlan to the show. Alan, how are you getting on? I'm good on, thanks, and yourself? All good. Are you feeling the fury that there's going to be a South African man as TMO tomorrow? Um, well, I'm hoping that uh, there'll be a bit of bite to the game and there'll be excitement and uh, the tempo will be be a lot higher and, and aggressive than what we've seen. Um, it's hard to it's hard to know on you know. I think obviously that South African A game last week that the the lines were beaten and was a bit of a wake up call to him and. Um, it was probably an indication of of the difference we're going to see in in the first test match compared to some of the other games the Lions have played. You know, complete mismatches, hard to read into them, hard to judge where they're at. Um, but there's still plenty of concerns, and I think the biggest concern is maybe you know the combinations for the Lions. Will they work? Will they gel together? And will they get a performance tomorrow? On the TMO though, what, what's your thoughts? I, I I don't know what you mean with the TMO. Sorry, say the, say that again. The, the the story this morning: the lines are furious over South African TMO. Uh, Warren Gatlin oh, said to be privately uh, very very annoyed that Marius Yonker has been appointed. As you mentioned, the South Africa game last week, a wake up call to say the least. But one of the other threads from it was Warren Gatland was not a happy camper with the Faf de Klerk decision, and Yonker was the TMO. Like I'm not necessarily saying that he he's right or right or wrong to be angry or, or privately furious, but you can be sure of one thing: he is going to be furious, and he, and he will make a point of this if there is a controversial decision. Yeah, he's out. He's speaking about it now. So I think it's that I, I put, he's trying to put the pressure on Marius Yonker. I think, look, um, there's going to be more focus and emphasis on sometimes it's a bad thing having someone from your home country involved, whether, you know, we've seen in the provincial games here sometimes when uh, when Frank Murphy and Andy Brace are reffing games, they're both aligned to, you know, Munster, um, even though Frank played for Connacht as well. And they, you know, often hear Leo Cullen talking about certain issues with Munster before the games. This goes on right across the board. Eddie Jones does it um, when England are playing. Warren Gatland, I suppose this is a little bit different. You know, we, Jakob Piper has ref, ref some of the Lions games so far and he's probably been harder on the South African teams and a little bit more favourable on, on the Lions side. But um, I think it's just mind games. I think mm-hmm. the whole world can see what what decisions will be made with Marius Jonker um, tomorrow as the TMO, and and um, it's just mind games for me. I didn't think that should have been a sending off last week. It's just Gatlin putting pressure on on the South African officials. Um, Faf de Klerk's one wasn't a red card for me last week, and it wasn't close to a red. I think um, he didn't make contact with Josh Navidi's neck area or, sh- or face area. So um, it's probably one of... <laughs> You know, Sod's Law here will get a big call that uh, <laughs> Marius Young girl will be kind of maybe uh, probably feel the pressure of the world uh, watching the, the, those decisions. But look, it's, it doesn't surprise me that the Warren comes out and, and plays those games. What, uh, what sort of level do you think that the, the Warren mind games are currently at? Do you think he's still got another level to go to over the next little while? Um, it depends. Like they'll obviously be doing some press today, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if you know. I, I I like Warren Gatland. I like him as my coach. He sticks up for his teams. He he really doesn't shirk away from 
from stuff that maybe other coaches do. He's he's very outspoken. Sometimes that can backfire. We all remember the one a few years ago where he said the Welsh players disliked the Irish the most. Um, and that kind of created the whole storyline for, for, for the week of that test match. Um, you know, saying that uh, they've they've damaged the, the, the uh, South Africans' egos um, in that A game and stopped their power game last week, I think is... A bit strange, but look, um, it doesn't really matter what any coach says, what anyone um, talks about here. It's about what they do in the field when they get there. And um, he may come out with something else. But Razzie kind of a shot back last week after that Faf de Clark um, incident when, when Warren Gatlin spoke about it. And, you know, he posted two video clips of Owen Farrell's uh, being involved in, in, in two tackles, one uh, grabbing Faf de Klerk around the neck and another in a tackle situation. So it's great. It's great for all of us watching. Um, it'd be great to, you know, hear them have a few sparks of, of uh, goes off each other today, but ultimately it doesn't matter on, you know, I've been there myself and it can give a little bit of motivation or a little bit of, um, give you a little bit of bite before the game if someone one of the opposition coaches speaks like that but ultimately they've got to go out and deliver and 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 produce performances and i like that when coaches kind of stick up for the, what they believe in on their own side and uh maybe we'll see more of it today is uh, peter de Villiers right quinny are the box boring um they can be um they can be i think uh they can be very direct um, Andre Pollard was asked about that during the week and he said it's beautiful beautiful rugby uh, and that's what they love because they love the the physical side of it it's you know I went to a couple of schools games in, in South Africa in 2016 when I was was out working on the, the, the Ireland's three, three tests there and I always love to do that when I go away on tours particularly since I've retired um, you know I've done it in New Zealand and Australia and you see the the difference in the approach from 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 the schoolboys games or the underage games, and you know, I went to a couple in South Africa, and again, there's a lot of kicking, um, there's a lot of straight line running, and um, you know, very set piece orientated game plans, and that's kind of in their DNA. Um, the Villiers, I suppose, didn't have a very successful stint with with South Africa, and so I suppose they're taking that with a grain of salt. Uh, when he starts speaking about how they play, um, I think they 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 certainly love the power game and they are very direct and that works to a point for them. But they now have game breakers and and you know some of it reminds me a little bit of of the monster teams that I played in and in, in, in of old. You know we were very very direct, um, very forward orientated, and then you had Stringer and O'Gara, you know, doing their stuff at nine and ten, and and O'Gara putting you into great positions and it worked really well for us. We we developed and changed obviously in 08 when we took Topoki, Maffi, Howell at these guys in our backline. And South Africa in a sense, you know, when I look at their backline, I think Dialinda is a great ball player. Uh Am is a brilliant 13 as well. You have Colby, Villy LaRue, Mapimpi. They're unbelievably attacking minded players who, if you give them time, space, um, allow them to produce their individual brilliance. They can cut you open, but they probably rely a little bit more on on broken field play of of turnover plays or or loose kicks where they can just do their do their thing, take on their opposition. You know, you you, you think Colby if he gets any sort of time and space with loose kicks, um, he can be just devastating. You saw the the sidestep there uh, in the A game and the break he made for Ams try and. You know, they did it in the World Cup final. So it's it going to be like no you're surprise. Saying, you're saying, it sounds like you're saying he's right, Gwynny, almost. Is it like that? That it's more yeah, broken yeah, play. They are, not yeah, 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 sorry. Their strengths. Yeah, yeah. But their strength is their power game. Um, yeah. And, and that's that. And, and being direct and being physical. And you don't want to take that away from guys, even if they're skillful. Like the Toy is a very skillful footballer. Khaleesi can play ball play as well. You know, Mustard, Estabet. These guys can. can can you know do the little offloads and 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 pass through the tackle and all that kind of stuff? But they do what they do best, what they've learned and what they, is traditional to them. So you know I don't blame them for that. Of course it can it can be predictable. You know you look at the World Cup semi final, Adrian, and and the, the win over Wales, and 
they struggled through that game, you know. Mm. Um, I think Dialinda scored a try and, and you know, Wales could have won that game. And then you think the performance then in the final where it's 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 power based a lot of it, but then you have the brilliance of 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 some of those backs that I mentioned. So they're capable of doing that. Of course you'd love to see them uh throw the ball all, all around a lot, but it's not it's not in their DNA. Um and it's been effective. So if they win the first test tomorrow and it's boring, they won't care less. Uh, maybe we'll all be complaining, giving out. I think the Lions have to play with more width, uh, be be far more expansive than South Africa, but also do the traditional stuff well um, and be aggressive themselves and match that power game. That, Go on. that style of rugby that you've been talking about there, guys, uh, Jack Conan was speaking about it yesterday in the media. He said that, that pragmatic style of rugby that they play is echoed from Munster into South Africa and he says he's been speaking to Conor Murray and Ty Byrne about it and he says we know how important set piece in the aerial battle is going to be I think that's the same when you are playing Munster is that, is that a fair comparison Alan? Yeah it is it is and I think um, you know under Jack Nienabar and Rossi Erasmus in Munster they I think it was the 2016-17 season when they got to the final 2016 they got to the final they were they were incredible that year they were so hard to beat Munster and um, hard to break down they put so much pressure on the opposition the box kicking uh from from Connor murray and the kicking from 10 was you know sublime it put them in really good areas and they they kind of had an intensity and an aggression that they put at the breakdown that was was very impressive um so a lot of it is quite similar but i think you know where they came up short obviously in this that that final against the Scarlets and then the semi final against against um, the one that stands out as the semi final against Saracens um, at the Aviva, you have to have some bit of variety in your game and you have to be able to produce scores out of nothing sometimes or or, or take that one or two one or two opportunities that present themselves when you have mismatches or you have numbers. So that's where they probably were let down and. You know, South African play can play that type of game probably better because, you know, they had so much power in that World Cup final. People were just in awe about the the pressure they put on a big, strong England side as well. Um, the physicality, the carries, the scrum, the line out, just pressure right across the board. So there is similarities for sure. And, and that's what they'll try and bring again tomorrow. Coping with that, how do you cope with that? And people have often asked me, and and we we've spoken about this. Um, you've, I think, where it starts, lads, is the set piece. You know that first scrum, that first line out, getting a bit of a rumble in the mall. It gives a a feel of confidence, gives you a little bit of momentum. And then when your opposite number runs at you, putting in, you know, not not letting South Africa get over the game line because they profit from that a lot. And the clerk is very very intelligent. He's world class. He's very, very intelligent in, in his little snipes and you know, bring in his loose forwards and stuff with little pop balls around the breakdown and, and they find little pockets and holes there. So you've got to stop that. And if you stop South Africa then and slow their breakdown down, and similar to what Leinster have tried to do with Munster a lot, is if you slow that breakdown and then you get lots of numbers on their feet, well, what are they going to do? Are they just going to shovel the ball across the back line and, and end up going behind the game line again or not? But, you know, South Africa can do it more effectively because they have more power and they have more quality and it's a higher level. The combinations thing, Quinny, obviously has been a lot said about it. Are, is it a case yeah. that we all read too much into it and spend too much time talking about the value of a combination or is Warren Gatlin taking a big risk? He's taking a risk. Um, I think the form is dictated to, you know, some of the selections even before the tour. Um, and you don't have any sort of cohesion there. Uh, right, you could put Gareth Davies in scrum half and you'd have Dan Bigger and himself there who would know each other very, very well. Mm. He's picked on form with Ali Price. So he says, um, I think he's gone over the experience of Conor Murray and his performance wasn't kind of where, where he Gatlin would have wanted last week. And that little bit of zip that... But you see, I, I, I find it hard to read too much into that because you're playing against the Stormer side. They're winning by 50 points and most scrum halves would, would um, but you know, do well behind the forward pack that was dominating like that. Um, Quinny, can I, can I ask you, sorry, sorry to cut across you, just on that specifically, 
why what's the case when the coaches are sat around and somebody in the room is making the case for Ali Price? What is it? It's just pace. It's it's uh, he's younger, he's quicker, he's zippier, and that doesn't mean he's a better player or more effective at what maybe the Lions want to do. Um, and look, the criticism of Conor Murray in the last couple of years is probably just pace getting. It's not his technique and his passing. It's just it's it's having that ability to really snipe and and bounce around and bounce in and out of breakdowns and and get the ball away quick, very quickly. And to be fair, that's Price's strength. Conor Murray's all-round game, his defensive work, even even his poaching at the breakdown, his kicking game is better. But I think where you know Price is just that little bit zippier. So you know when you're having these selection meetings, I think it's maybe, and and he's very very entitled, Sam, and that's why he's picked as Gregor Townsend is saying, look, I know what Ali Price can do. I know his big strength here. He can, he's just that bit quicker at getting maybe to the breakdown and 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 bouncing out of the breakdown quicker. So. That's why they've gone for that. And it's an indication that, of course, they're saying it's a form selection, that they want to get the ball away as quickly as possible from the breakdown. You don't want it slowing down there and, and enabling the South Africans to counter up and all that kind of stuff. And the idea would be try and move them around as quickly as you can. And that's not necessarily all the time running it, but it's good kicking, getting it into Bigger's hands early so he can find some space in the backfield. And that half a second can make a big difference. So... Um, the combinations thing does concern me because, you know, it's what we'll be talking about after the weekend. If, if the Lions lose tomorrow, we'll be saying, you know, Robbie Henshaw a bit undercooked himself and um, Elliot Daly have only played, you know, 57 minutes together last week. It's not a lot. Daly hasn't played since 2016 as a centre. Um, it's a bit disjointed. And the biggest ones are the halfbacks. Jack Conan hasn't played against South Africa before, but he's in on form. So... You can read too much into it, but if they get it right, and I'm sure there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes, even though they're preparing for the other games that they've played, I think they'll certainly have been working on some strike plays and, and things like that. And there's a lot of big players out there. I think, you know, Dan Bigger is is when things go well for him and he's on song, he can be he can be brilliant. Um and you know, the idea of bringing Alan Wynne Jones back in as captain, I think even though we're all disappointed from an Irish point of view that Conor Murray is there, I think Alan Wynne Jones' leadership is really needed. I think they've lacked a little bit of leadership this Lions team the last few weeks. Just that little bit of cohesiveness, particularly up front in the forward pack, decisions they've made. Um, so it didn't surprise me that he he came back in with that leadership, Alan Wynne Jones. That point that you touched on earlier on then about the scrum, Alan, and about uh, Gatlin maybe trying to has poked the bear a little bit by talking about the, the ego being dented of, of South Africa at the end of that that A game. I, I got the sense that you're, you're not buying that at all, that you felt that South Africa will be either A, relatively happy with how they did in the scrum in that South Africa A game, or B, have another level to go to and, and they'll show it tomorrow. Um, yeah, look, you, you're never going to go out in a match like this or even at international level unless there's a glaring, glaring... Uh, difference in 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 the scrums sometimes it's only a couple of percent sometimes it's just getting a nudge on the day um and one or two scrums you might guess get them in your favor and 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 you win the game and it can be big decisions you know the same way as i always talk about lineouts i probably like a broken record one line out can win a game for you one line out can lose a game for you you know if you don't execute it right and the scrum is the same so um you know getting that you know, the first line scrum tomorrow, if they get a little nudge on or force a penalty or something, they're, they're big moments for players. And I know when you're in the middle of that that battle, it's a big psychological thing. It's a chance to pat your front row on the back and just make them feel strong, make them feel like they're ready for this and that they're not going to take a backward step. Um, and that's really important. So, you know, the beast is not there for, for South Africa. He's retired. Kitsoff is on the bench. Nisha is playing Ox Nisha and he's, uh, you know, a bit inexperienced, but he's a very powerful um, block of a fella. Um, I'm sure Ty Furlong will try and go after him. And Yikanya, who was there in South Africa, got injured before, before, you know, early on in the tournament with a hamstring injury. He plays and Malherbe is on the bench. Um, there's a lot of power and strength there, but I think there's a, an opportunity for the Lions to go after their scrum. 
and, and really try and put them under pressure. And obviously, we've got the two experienced players coming off the bench, and that's the hope for Jack Nienenberg, that they can at least get parity and the two starting props can do well. Um, but like I say, it's a big... It's sometimes, you know, you have parity in these scrums, but we've seen games where teams have been dominated and things start to fall asunder for you then. So it's a great area to really impose yourself. Look at Leinster against Saracens last year when the scrum started going wrong for Leinster and the Aviva. It just starts to have a snowball effect on the whole team. Um, so look, I'm not saying the Lions are going to have an edge here, but I think it's an area that they'll really, really be focusing on. If they get it right there, well, then they can play some rugby off the back of that scrum. And... Um, it's an area you can impose yourself and get that confidence boost, if you like. Um, but it's always an intrigue and they're hard to call it. I don't see a glaring weakness in either side. and You, you just never know. But I think there's more experience. I think Furlong has, a, has an opportunity to go after his opposite number. What is the test score line going to be? Uh, I fancy South Africa to win this one. But I think the line's probably... Um, a while back, I fancied him to go to South Africa and win the series, but I just got a bit of a, a shock myself last week that they were kind of exposed. I noticed there's, there's, there's a lot of different players. And the fact that, you know, normally before tours, you could pick at least eight to ten, possibly more starters before a tour on the back of Six Nations where you say, look, big English players, big Irish players, Welsh, Scottish, you know, um, the Scottish have always had had the least amount of players in recent t- tours anyway, but you could always pick 10, 12 guys who you say, look, they're starters. They're big characters. Uh, they're, gay, they're, they're in form and they won't be daunted by the task. I really remember that going to New Zealand a couple of years ago and, and the Australian one in 13 when I was working for both those tours. Um, and I just we haven't seen that this year, you know. Um, so I, I, I would concern me that fact and the combination. So I think whoever wins tomorrow is is in the driving seat. Um, and I think South Africa possibly win the series 2-1. Right, so South Africa tomorrow and South Africa overall. Alan Quinlan, great stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers, thanks lads. Cheers, Alan Quinlan there with us. And he'll be back with us next Monday morning as well here on OTB AM. Right, at 8.32, just to tell you that the OTB Sports Olympic Show will be live across OTB every evening from 5pm across the next three weeks. And we'll be bringing you the biggest stories of the day and previewing what's to come. It'll all be brought to you in association with Indeed, who are proud uh, to support Team Ireland at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Indeed believes the world works better when people are given every opportunity to unleash their true talents. Hashtag talent unleashed. Now, Jason Quigley joined the OTB Sports Olympic show last night for our big Irish boxing preview. Here he is on what Kelly Harrington needs to do. For the lads that are getting, or the women that are getting a tough draw, they have to get in there and grab the opportunity. Hmm. For the lads and women that are getting in there that mightn't have, like Kelly Harrington is is up against... um, I can't remember who she up the winner of so and so, but she has to get in there. And these two girls have never really—they're not a big name at the minute. Whereas Kelly is a former world champion; she's the number one seed. She has to get in there and set the mark, set the tone early, and uh, get off to a good start because it's a long time being out there in training camp. You know, getting used to the surroundings all going through all the qualifying stages, everything like that. It's a long journey and it's a long route to get to where they are now. And they just have to remember everything that they've been through, get into that ring and just put on a class performance. Yeah, because Kelly has to wait until Friday week. She's not going to be exactly until 3am on Friday week, July 30th, for those interested. She's going to be taking on the, either the Italian Rebecca Nicoli or Mexican Esmeralda Falcone. So she has a bit yeah. of a time to wait. That's the thing that can kind of eat at you, but she has something to look forward to in the sense that she can analyse that fight and break down uh, the strengths and weaknesses of whoever it is that comes through and then act upon that. But she does have a target on her back because she is the big name going into these uh, Olympic Games from an Irish perspective and probably, I guess, indeed, uh, in, in women's boxing in general. Yeah, like, and um, we all know Kelly and uh, she's she's a great person for boxing. She's lovely, down to earth, a good, honest person that gets in there and gives it her absolute all. And uh, I don't think that that kind of thing will get to her. 
But when it comes to these clinical moments, this is where you need to be fully focused. You can't have any slip of the slip of the focus, slip of the determination, you know, everything needs to be looked at now, you know, your phones, your social media use, you know, you can't have any negative thoughts coming into your head. You need to stay as positive, as positive a routine as you can also. And uh, I really believe that, you know, I think everyone is looking at Kelly as our biggest metal hope. And I hope she doesn't take that on her. I hope she just yeah. goes there, has fun, gives it her absolute best. And and I hope all these fighters know that we're we're so proud of them for getting to where they've got to already, to to get them to have that flag on their back, to have getting to have that team Ireland across their back and representing our country at this Olympic Games. Jason, quickly talking about Kelly Harrington there. You can get that piece now on otbsports.com or on the OTB Sports app. Right now at 8.35, it is time for our quick picks. So many critics, these pundits. I absolutely adore them, lads. I have unbelievable time from, but they're, they're a great bunch, but it's not acceptable. I'd like to play the hard man when, when they're on it. It's not very pleasant when you're trying to manage a team. All you're looking for is a bit of civility and a bit of decency, but they just dismiss you like, like you, you know, you have nothing to do with the bloody occasion. We have officially entered the business end of the championship season. We have entered the business end of the quick pick season. Last week, there was a massive twist as we changed the entire rules to try and break up the empire. That is Adrian Barry's ability to correctly predict GAA events from uh, that will actually happen. And uh, he has not been deterred. It's the bad news this morning. Uh, Adrian Barry, in the new format, was the top scorer last week, so he has actually increased his lead. And we can have a look at the table as a result of last week's results. Adrian Barry now on 37 points, Willow Callahan and Tommy Rooney on 32 points, and there I am on 31 points, Ooh. bottom of the table. Mm. We will. Uh, oh, and you've you've made a mistake with that table. How? How is Will ahead of me? You're a level. You're not level. Yeah, but how is W ahead of T? <laughs> uh, it's a good point. Very good point. I'm serious. I want to be. I yeah. want that table altered before the end of this week's quick picks. That is, um, I, I guess, a very, very neat way of, of clinging on to things at the moment. Will I guess I've gone from bottom to second. Has the better has had the better season so far. Um, so yeah, congratulations to you all. I mean, if Kerry's hurlers hadn't uh, COVID in the camp, uh, they would have won that game, and my ah, prediction would have been correct. Mm. And you know what? Stop. Look, I mean, I'm not here. I'd like, I mean, we all hate people who make excuses, but look, I mean, that's just the reality of the situation, isn't it? Uh, let's no, get into it's it's this. True. And by the way, Wes made sure the beaten Kildare hey. and I would have been even further ahead. This you're only top because you made a mistake. You meant to say Mead were going to lose by 16 points, not six. No, not a bit of it. Is that true? No, it's not. Okay. Oh, but just come on now. Listen, like, look, the the point to be made, and let's park it here, is that the the organisers have set in train a new format with a view to topple the king, and uh, the king is even stronger than ever. I am Dublin. I know how they feel. You certainly are. It's time for the very serious business of this week's predictions. The football is where we begin, and everybody's gone for the same teams here, and this is why we changed the format. So. First up is Cork versus Kerry. It is a Munster final. It is an opportunity for revenge for Kerry after losing last year's Munster semi-final. But it's an opportunity for Cork for revenge as well, kind of, after losing last week's last year's Munster final themselves. So Adrian is going for Kerry by eight. I'm going for Kerry by four. Tommy's going for Kerry by ten. And Will is going for Kerry by five. Let's start with the upper end of the scale. Tommy, why are you going double figures? I can't believe you boys are going so conservative here. Mm. That's Cork. Cork can't score against Kerry. They can't. They got 13 scored last year. 112. They got, um, what was it, 310 the previous year? 13 scores. 310 is a pretty good score. They scored, yeah, but they scored 2-4 in, in 2018. Like, I know they racked up a massive score against Westmead, but I'm just struggling to see where they're going to get scores from this weekend. And Kerry have been absolutely exceptional. Now, at the start of the week, I wasn't saying 10 points. I had it in my head that possibly Kerry could get spooked, that everything has gone so well for them this year, that they'll come up against Cork, there'll be you know, a bit of muscle memory from the, the horrors of last year, and maybe they could get spooked or freaked a wee bit. But I just, the closer we get to the weekend, I don't see it happening. They, their attack is functioning exceptionally well. They had an eye on Dublin last year, but even if they got to play Dublin last year, they weren't going like the way they're going now, like. They weren't set up the way they're set up now. Carrier, carrier here, like. 
why is this different? Why? What did you see? So remove the court game, remove the results from it and remove that performance from it. Kerry were league champions last year. Yeah. What, what did you... What was different about the way Kerry won the league last year to the way they won the league this year then? Because they haven't been impressive enough in the championship for um, the whole Dublin thing to be turning. So you're basing this on league, I assume. So I'm what, basing this on on the let's say the setup of their forwards. So they're no longer playing an Obiogli at wing forward or Paul Murphy. They're no longer trying to shoehorn somebody else into the full forward line. They've Sean O'Shea and David Clifford inside. They've Paddy and Darren Moynihan back a bit further. They've Ganey and Stephen O'Brien. Take your pick playing as, you know, across that middle third or, or deep wing forwards. They're functioning exceptionally well. Like Kitty and Splan is, Kitty and Splan isn't starting at 14 last week when Darren Moynihan doesn't start. Like Mial Burns is in because he's fulfilling a role there. They're not just picking their best six forwards. They have the they have six forwards functioning incredibly well, and they're lethal. They're absolutely lethal at the minute. And you know Sean Powder was exceptional for Cork last year, and I think they missed him massively against Tipperary. He only played forty odd minutes against Limerick last week. He's talking big talk this week. I hope the God he's there because if he is, it'll make it a proper game. But um, Cork. Cork really need powder and more to step up this weekend. You mentioned the 13 scores being a poor tally. You would not have said that. I didn't hear anybody say 13 scores is a poor tally when Dublin put up 13 scores against Kerry and Thurless a few months ago. The thing about getting 13 scores against Kerry is that sometimes a handful of them can be goals. And for me, last year was an aberration. Yes, it was. But I would have concern about, and this is not concern that I think Kerry are going to lose the game, but concern about going for a 10-point win, Tommy, is that the 2019 evidence is also pretty interesting when, when you study that year and, and the way Kerry were properly on the rack uh, in, in that game. Granted, it's Cork, and I do think the Clarny factor is, is, is a reason why maybe you can go a bit bigger uh, with, with, with your prediction. But I, I think that there is, there is evidence beyond the aberration, and I think there's evidence this year that Kerry have conceded goals and in, in the biggest games that they've played. They're bloodthirsty, though. But like they so have Cork, been this but, year. But like, they you... murdered. They murdered go like go away. Like they didn't yeah. let up against Tyrone in the league. I agree, you know, but I, I they're think... like Dublin three or four years ago. That's where Kerry are at at the minute. They're think, like Dublin three or four years ago. I think that analysis though is like th- that is true. But I th- I think that this analysis has been very one eyed in what Kerry are going to do to stop Dublin when they're coming up against a Cork team that are bloodthirsty after getting humiliated in the Munster final last year. Uh, and and that is why like it's not it's so not. Oh, and somebody needs to put a stop to this. It's, the, your, go this for it, Adrian. Go thank for you, Adrian. Defending the, thank I, you. I actually took great comfort from seeing that table for the first time and seeing that you had gone so low because that gives me great comfort that myself <laughs> and Tommy are absolutely in the right direction. I'm sorry, Will, but I think that you've been drawn in there by the Yerism, pre Yerism. And I think that um, Tommy's 100% spot on, like revenge on their mind, unbelievable firepower at their feet. Uh, Kerry, and and like Tommy said, have shown such a bloodthirst about them this year. I just think all this other stuff about... Look, I know we were we were having a conversation. I was looking back at it last night, uh, pre the semi final last year. Uh, Owen, yourself, myself, and Louise Galvin talking about it, and Louise was trying to make a bit of a case for Cork. And overall, I just felt we were being yared away. And I know the way that game went, but it's just a different beast this year. And uh, I think that when Kerry get the foot in the throat, they're not the team now to take it off. And that's why I think, a, to be honest, is, is the extreme end of where I think it'll be at. I think ten might be a bit too much, but equally, I just think any sort of a case that you're making here to pour one water on the idea that Kerry again are a team that are a lot of people are feeling they can beat Dublin this year so um, they need to they need to be an 8 or 10 points better team than Cork they I think the spread I think the, the spread could be uh, I actually don't I, I, I was about to say a number there and I was like I haven't checked this I would actually I'll be find it I'll find it uh, Will, Will, go, Will get, get, uh, come on in here yeah, I was going to say, look, in terms of whether this is Yerism or not, like, we're not debating whether Cork are going to win here. We're literally fighting True. over the distance of the spread. Like, yeah. we're all accepting that uh, Kerry are actually going to come out on top. I don't know if Cork's scoring is going to be the issue against Kerry this weekend. I think Cork have actually been a decent scoring machine so far this year. The problem may well be that they're going to concede so much at the far end. Like, I can see this actually being quite a high-scoring game, but Kerry not necessarily pulling away in the way that Tommy's anticipating to win by 10 points, like, particularly when it's a provincial final too. Look, maybe we're going to see a statement performance, and maybe that's what, you know, Kerry will want to do to set themselves up nicely for an All-Ireland semi-final this year and to erase any doubts that people might have from last season. I would agree with Owen. I think last year is a complete aberration and we can't really consider that too much when we look into what's going to happen this weekend. But 
I wouldn't be totally surprised if Cork, like I think I've gone for four on the differential. I wouldn't be surprised if Cork were within five points and yet Kerry still feel very comfortable winners, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mm. th- see that. That's kind of what I'm going for. Like, it's not Yarism if you're picking Kerry to win. Let's just make that clear here. This is very much me predicting Kerry to win and uh, having a, a four point margin in doing so. Let's bring up the football predictions again. The spread is nine, by the way. Have a look. The spread is nine. Okay, so we're all going under that. Like, I, and I do think it's the, I'm going the, over. the, the home. Uh, sorry, uh, Tommy, you're, you're going over. My apologies. Will, you're going for five, by the way, rather than four. Mm. Uh, Mayo versus Galway, then. We're very tight on this one. I'm going for four as well on this one. Uh, Adrian and Tommy, you're both going for two. And Will, you're going for three. You might kick us off on this one, Will. Yeah, uh, again, look, based on what we've seen from Mayo so far this season, they've spread their scores around uh, since they've lost Killian O'Connor, which was the one major concern you would have had going into the season. Last year's uh, game between these two was like an absolute arm wrestle, which I don't think Mayo are going to get dragged into quite the same again. Um, God, Galway, it's so hard to know what you're getting from them this season. Like, you get performances like the Kerry game, then you get other games where it seems to click for them, and... Like against Ross Common in what was a horrific fixture, Galway were still by far uh, the better team in that game. But for me, like Mayo are probably four or five points the better team. But again, I kind of expect this one to be very close because it's going to be you know the nerves of two rivals taking on each other. But Mayo should have a little bit to spare back into the last four in the country again for this season. I just, I can't see Galway putting in a performance to actually topple them this weekend. We're uh, quite tight in time. So I just want to bring up the hurling predictions and just kind of throw this one out. Uh, If we have a look at what is coming up this weekend in the hurling, we have two games. We've got Waterford against Galway. Everybody's picking a Galway win here. And myself and Tommy going for the biggest win here by seven points. Adrian's going for four. Will's going for two. Then in the Clare, uh, Cork game there's a split Will's going for Cork by three I'm going for Clare by two as is Tommy and Adrian's going for Clare by six so uh, Tommy just to, to finish up here out of your other three predictions then what, which is the one here that you're least confident about I presume it's Clare and the hurling or Mayo in the football yeah I, I was close to going for I never thought of going for Galway in the, I never wrote down Galway when I was typing out my answer to you yesterday but it was close with Claire, I think my original one was after extra time. I think this one is going to go down to the wire. But I actually think we didn't see the best of Claire against Wexford last week. Even Tony Kelly was quite quiet. The likes of Ryan Taylor and Shannon had decent games. Um, I just think we're going to see a bit more out of Claire this weekend. Like Cork were being touted as All Ireland favourites at, you know, the start of the league. Not All Ireland favourites, All Ireland contenders would say at the start of the league. And Claire were completely dismissed after the Antrim match. So I just think that it's kind of levelled out a bit more ever since. I think Clare would have preferred to get Galway at this stage um, rather than Cork. So it's going to be close. But yeah, it, it was a tight call. Adrian, where are you vulnerable this week? I think it's the Mayo-Galway game, isn't it? Like it's, you just, uh, back in Galway in the hurling is a bit like back in Mayo in the football that you're just really not sure what you're going to get. But uh, they, they'll get caught, I think, by Killian's absence at some point. But I don't, I don't think it'll be this weekend. And Clare, by the way, I think are the, are the second best team in the country. And um, I think that there could be a bit of a margin in that game at the weekend. So, so you think who's the second best team in the country? Clare. Clare is the second best team in the country. What, what's uh, what's really? giving you that optimism? I just think when they once they once the taps open up, like Tommy said, they didn't even hit, fully hit their straps last weekend. Tony Kelly will uh, maybe maybe didn't have his best game last weekend, but he'll uh, I, him him on his own. Tony Kelly is a line on his own as to why Clare are the uh, second best team in the country. Some of them have maybe fallen away in a way that we didn't fully expect. By the way, it should be we should pay tribute to. Um, <clears throat> Will shout last week that Leash would be uh, was it last weekend Leash yeah. would be close enough to yeah. Waterford um, and that's, that's the way I played out so it was, a, it was a, one of the shouts of the summer I'd say so far um, but yeah that outstanding I just think Clare look brilliant when they're in full flow uh, when they hit their straps I think they could they wouldn't beat Limerick but they'd run them close Will as close you, as anyone you, you actually completely disagree with that because you think they're going out this weekend yeah, the, the only thing is I'm a little bit concerned about Galway now because of the news breaking this morning that they've got at least one COVID-19 case in their camp. We saw what that did to Dublin in the Leinster final against Kilkenny. It's one of the down points of putting in our predictions on a Thursday evening and then something like this can break just before the game. So Galway might well be affected by that. Like I think um, Waterford are going to have an improved performance from last week. I was chatting to the leash manager Cheddar Plunkett and he made the point that this might be the best possible thing to happen to Waterford, that they got a right good shock last week, had to pull it out of the fire, and they know that they can't put in another below power performance or they're going to be out of the championship. I'm Look, I'm kind of hedging on Cork being as good as the potential we saw earlier in the year from them. That's really where I'm basing this one against Clare. I think for Clare as well, it's difficult to go 
three back-to-back weeks and put in performances. And mm. it's difficult to read on last week as well, lads, when it came to the Clare Wexford game because Clare had the game almost killed after the first quarter because they'd given themselves a double digits lead. And then it was a case of just outscoring Wexford for the rest of the game. I don't think we saw a very complete performance from Clare last week, but if Clare can not cork out and put themselves into an All-Ireland quarterfinal, I don't think too many teams will want to face Clare from this point on. All right. Well, best of luck all three of you this weekend but like I mean realistically no good luck to any of you because we need to change this table around comprehensively over the next little while Will you're going to stay with us because we do want to chat to you about Offaly under 20s last night what a win for them but that for this week is the quick picks I absolutely adore them lads I have unbelievable time from but they're, they're a great bunch but it's not acceptable Offaly are back Will O'Callaghan they really are. Uh, finally, our run of Leinster final defeats has come to an end on 15 in a row across all age grades before last night. And finally now, they've got their hands on the Flood Cup after waiting 26 years and managed to break it in the middle of the presentation as well. So um, <laughs> that handle was not very well attached. Uh, we wondered, was there going to be a joint captain moment uh, because the Offaly captain was injured uh, last evening. So he got to go up in his um, you know, his shorts mm. and his uh, team T-shirt, but didn't actually get to lift the cup jointly, which I think is what should really have happened where there's a standing captain and an injured captain. But that's another one with that change that came around to Congress. But... I thought Offaly were really good. It was a coming-of-age performance for a lot of players who are very highly considered within the county, uh, like Jack Bryant, who scored six points. Uh, the feeling is that he's almost ready now to step into John Mohan's side to provide a bit of competition for the full forward line for Division Two football for next season. And Cormac Egan, you know, won, I think, everyone's cult status last night because of his flowing locks on his mullet, but also his uh, cheetah-like running at different stages during the game and how direct he played against that Dublin backline in the second half. Like, Cormac's a remarkable athlete lads he played in two Leinster minor finals a couple of weeks ago both in the hurling and football final star player for both the hurlers and footballers then joins the under 20 panel I think 10 days ago officially and then he plays a starring role in the under 20 final where off get the better of three in a row chasing Dublin so some of these young talented players coming through uh, definitely underlined that there's potential in Offaly right now wow that's incredible I didn't realize that like this is kind of a reminder as well seeing some of the scenes yesterday that we haven't actually seen an outpouring from Offaly in any sense in such a long time it's a, it's a brilliant sight Will Yeah look it's been miserable and most of us have been cynical particularly over the last decade or so uh, because of the slide which looks like it might be getting arrested in hurling uh, by potentially winning the Christie Ring and Division 2 of the National League this season and then the footballers have got themselves up into the second flight for the first time in over 10 years. And also now it looks like there's another bunch of players coming through, which is actually going to bolster the panel. Like Rory Egan, who played uh, last night, and I thought a very good game of the halfbacks, has already been name-checked by John Mohan as a player to potentially come in uh, to the senior panel too. And like Jack Bryant to this stage is definitely going to push for a place. Like Some of his point-taking last night, I don't know if you saw the uh, score that he hit with the outside of his boot over on the 45-metre line um, to give Offaly a score to go ahead. Like The defence as well has to get huge credit for... Dublin didn't score a point after 20 minutes into the game. Like The goals kept them in it, but second half, Dublin scored a solitary score, and that was their third goal in the second half. So... Like it was a very kind of efficient performance from Offaly and a bit like the games against Wexford and Westmeath, which I watched on Tube. Like they probably should have won all three of their games quite comfortably this year, but they have this kind of ability to stick into matches and just get on the right side of the result. And when the Miners were losing out by a point just a few weeks ago in a Leinster final, you'll always take that over, say, a swashbuckling performance. And hopefully this is a big psychological boost for Offaly, given all those defeated finals. And again, young Furlong playing at centre-back. Uh, I saw Pat Nolan, um, who'd be a Tullamore clubman of his, uh, put up on Twitter last night that I think over 50% of Offaly's Leinster titles have now been won with a furlong playing in the team. So uh, some very proud traditions have been carried on. And a lot of the Offaly legends were on the pitch after the game last night. And Cormac Egan's great interview on TG Carr referenced that. So, like, sometimes the weight of history hangs on a county like Offaly where these guys have grown up hearing about stories of their fathers and grandfathers playing for the county. Uh, but that lineage was very much seen and the importance of tradition, which was stressed by the management team going into the game against Dublin. And hopefully it gives a bit of hope to the rest of the province that Dublin can be beaten in a big game. Well, O'Callaghan, enjoy the celebrations and enjoy the weekend. Thanks, million. Take it easy, lads. Cheers. And Adrian Barry, I think that last note is something that you've got great joy from yourself, seeing somebody other than Dublin win. 
Ah, yeah, totally. I, I do think there was like a. I do think most of the country is tuned in to uh, to that on some level. That uh, you know the Dubs can be beaten, and like Will said, obviously in terms of the game, it wasn't as if Offaly sort of fluked over the line or they just got over the line. They won it by a few points and kept Dublin to about six scores. Like, what does all that mean for the future of Dublin football? Maybe we're also reading too much into that. I don't know, but. Um, certainly in terms of green shoots and like I look at you can assume that it's tough on, on underage players particularly but there's a lot of Dublin football fans out there at the minute that wouldn't mind seeing their senior team uh, maybe maybe not in the current format right I, I certainly accept that but wouldn't mind seeing their senior team been beaten in Leinster at some point mm, I think that's definitely uh, true like are, are you uh, subscribing to the theory that Leinster was a, a big positive that, like took a big positive step forward last Sunday like yeah, kind of absolutely, level. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I do think that uh, I was listening to your seven Jar on Monday talking about it. I definitely subscribe to the Dublin have come back to the uh, to the pack a bit theory. They haven't reached the pack yet, I don't think. But um, like, there's still a lot of experience there. It's funny that Cluxton conversation, and I don't know if you find it, but people that I'm, that I would bump into around the Cluxton conversation is almost the go-to for people now in any sport conversation at the minute. Will he? Won't he? What's he doing? The impact on Comerford. Like there's a bit of there's definitely a bit of intrigue on that. Um I always felt that when it became clear that was what was happening, that Desi kinda had said to him, Listen, might need you <clears throat> if that's the case, be good if you didn't fully retire and you know, we can we can bring you in. Um mm. and I mean he's probably headed that direction now, you know. Yeah, it certainly looks that way at this point. Right at 8.56 on this Friday morning, it is time to keep our previews going of the weekend's football action. Delighted to be welcomed, or to be joined rather, by uh, Breed Stack, Cork football legend. Breed, how are you getting on? Good, how are you keeping? Yeah, good, thanks. Uh, Sean Powder during the week was in the media saying, I fully believe we're going to beat them. You'd love to see that Cork confidence going into Sunday. Do you share it yourself? Um, I suppose, look, you can only look at what's been, um, I suppose, on display the last the last couple of weeks and the last couple of games. Um, and I suppose you, you'd have to question Cork a little bit. Um, I suppose you go back to the Limerick game, um, only one Cork forward um, scored from play within 60 minutes. Um, there was a lot of injuries going into the game. There was a lot of injuries that came out of that game. So I suppose from that point of view, you would be a little bit worried as a Cork supporter going into the game on on. Um, on Sunday, but I suppose you you have to look at positives. Um, uh, I suppose look, Cork I think have um, a, an ability to maybe catch Kerry at midfield. Um, I definitely think you know um, how important E. McGuire is at midfield. Um, you know he he's a real uh, primary possession winner, and uh, I suppose if you could just get the ball in a little bit quicker into the inside forward line, you know you're you're really going to be at an advantage. Um, I think maybe Brian Hartnett, the gamble of Brian Hartnett at wing forward, maybe didn't pay off for them, but I suppose it was a good experiment to try out. And I think Brian Hartnett is definitely a more out and out midfielder. So, you know, Brian Hartnett and Ian McGuire at midfield, I think is is definitely a better pairing. And uh, I suppose that's what I would expect to see on Sunday is, is a strong midfield from uh, from Cork. You look at uh, Kerry versus Tipperary, they won uh, nine of Tipperary's kickouts um, in the first half. So I just think the importance of winning primary possession is going to be vital for Cork and um, to not be put on the back foot and I know I suppose just get their big day players into the game. Um, you know, we saw maybe Rory Dean and Connolly not maybe at the, at their best um, against Limerick. They were a little bit quite by their own standards. So I would expect, a, you know, a much um, I suppose much um, more intensity from from Cork going into Kerry um, as well. I think the importance of getting Mark Collins on, um, he was carrying maybe not going into that Limerick game, so to get him a little bit of game time was important. And I can definitely see Mark Collins starting. And so there definitely will be a bit of a reshuffle. Um, but the importance, I think, of Potter and the importance of, um, of oh my God, uh, Daniel O'Mahony as well to come in um, Two of them went off with injuries um, versus Limerick, so I just think the importance of two of them being um, being made available for Cork, um, you know, can't be stressed enough. Um, definitely, I suppose the backs kind of, you know, really dragged Cork over the line the last day. We saw Matty Taylor coming up, we saw Keen Kiley coming on as substitute, all shipping in with scores. So I just think if you can, you know, confidence is always going to be going to be high, especially I suppose given how well they did last year, how well they coped. 
versus Kerry last year and how they went at them for for the full game. They stayed in it. They stayed in it. And look, I suppose you know maybe it was a bit of an ambush at the end. I don't know. We see another ambush. I don't think Kerry are going to be that naive again. But um, I suppose from a car point of view, you have to take um, a couple of positives, and that is that there is a potential there for a very strong midfield and um, I suppose the potential to win primary possession is just going to be vital. That, that, that strength of midfield is, is really interesting. So so are you seeing a weakness either tactically or personnel-wise in that department for Kerry then? Uh, no, I, I suppose it's just that's, you know, Dave Morn and um, Dave Morn has, has huge prowess there obviously and um, midfield would have always typically, I suppose, been been seen as an area of um, of good contest there between Cork and Kerry, um, I suppose, down through the years. And just the importance of winning primary possession is vital. And I do think Ian McGuire is playing, you know, at good confidence this year. If we could just get the ball in a little bit quicker, you know, he um, he does carry the ball a bit. But I suppose, look, that's the game plan that they that they had to use for for a couple of games. Um, but you would love them to. I suppose to just have a little bit more look up football and let the ball into an inside forward line that could potentially do a lot of damage. In some ways, Brad, I'm sort of um, not quite surprised, but somewhere on that scale to hear you talk about the confidence of Cork, just given what happened last year and maybe the the lift post carry that didn't really arrive, obviously in the Tipperary game or in the league. Yeah. Where where's your sense of um, yeah, like that confidence and where Cork are at nearly heading into the game? Yeah, well, look, you, you have to be confident. Um, you know, there, there's no point in turning up otherwise. And I suppose, look, like I said, they did stay in, in the game a lot um, of of um, the Munster semi-final last year. And then, look, just that little bit of luck, um, as well as, I suppose, like that, just st- staying in touch the whole time through the game. Um, I don't think Kerry are going to be that naive again. Like last year, we saw Kerry not pick six out-and-out forwards um, in that game versus Cork. I think Bruno Bugley was a late introduction and I don't think Kerry are going to be that naive again. They have, like, they're an out-and-out um, scoring team. They have massive trust in their um, in their forward line to win ball out in front. So, that, like, they, they're a lovely kicking team and they, like I said, win ball out in front and they have just such potent forward line as well as, I suppose we saw, look, how cutting Gavin White can be um, in the semi-final versus Tipperary. And, you know, it probably took Gavin White to to you know have that searing run to set up Clifford for the goal and and then Kerry you know just really kicked on but the big thing with Kerry is that they just kept retaining possession and um you know that's what they're so potent at until they get the right men on the ball um yeah so I just don't think they're going to be that naive again I think they're they trust their back line a lot more this year and they're just playing out and out football we saw the dismantling that they did to Tyrone um you know a good couple of weeks back and yeah, I just I suppose I'd be a bit fearful of a goal fest, but um, mm. you know, you'd have to you'd have to trust that Cork would want to be well set up and and that they have to be well set up. But I would just hope that Cork uh, have a have a have a full personnel, you know, um to, to choose from. And it did seem that Tipperary were a little bit fearful of that goal fest as well in Thurless a couple of weeks yeah. ago and, and set up to counteract that. And they yeah, and they set up a little bit defensive and I just think like Cork went to Kerry um, a lot more last year. I think you have to you just have to wage your bets a little bit and you have to trust, you know, like that, that your defence are going to to do their job. And they did, you know, they did very well versus Limerick. And it was just a case of, I suppose, you just need to get your forwards firing. And I don't think our forwards would be as quiet as they were against Limerick. And um, so that's, that's, that's the hope anyway. Um, but I, I don't think you're going to get an ambush um, like we got last year. What would your advice be to whoever is marking David Clifford then? Oh God, like, it's, it's like anything, you know, if you have such potent forwards like you have there, you have to try to curtail the ball that's coming into them. And um, I suppose that starts with with your um, with your forwards that you're putting massive, massive pressure um, on kickouts, that you're putting massive pressure on ball um, that's been kicked in, that it's, I suppose, that it's not going to be a 70-30 ball, that it's not being played to this advantage, that you try to help out your defence as much as possible. So I suppose that's what you can do, just I suppose it's just going to take massive work rate. And I think Carker not going to be naive to that they know that there needs to be massive work rate all over the field Galway against Mayo then how do you see this one going because uh, I, I guess we've been looking through maybe the, the spread in the cork Kerry game which seems quite generous actually that, that Cork are seen as big outsiders not the case in, in, in Galway Mayo it seems like a bit of a, a coin toss actually which I'm surprised but I would have had Mayo maybe as relatively healthy favourites a couple of weeks ago is, is this just us talking ourselves into what could be a, a massive win for Galway? Um 
yeah, like I, like I would, I would be of the same. I would probably, you know, lean a little bit more towards Mayo, just going on what you've seen. And I think Horn is around long enough that they're not going to, you know, get too ahead of themselves with, um, I suppose, you know, with how they've come through Connacht. Um, but I suppose the biggest thing for Mayo is that they have a massive spread of of scores now. They have a lot more options up front. The I suppose the intensity and the ruthlessness that they're playing with, um, and they're playing with a lot of or without a lot of leaders, which you know is is testament I suppose to a lot of lads stepping up to the plate. Um, and I suppose you know the last day versus Leitrim, um, you know Aidan Shea was quite by his own standards, but to see players like Conroy and Alan and um, Cohen, you know, really taking the game on and I suppose make it their own. Um, I think Oshin Mullen has been um, absolutely wonderful for Mayo and really, really exciting when, you know, to see him play at centre back and to see him play with such a plum, you know, at centre back. So I think there's a lot of positives for Mayo, um, both Galway, but they haven't been tested. I suppose that's the biggest thing, you know, and they probably haven't been tested massively since the Clare game. So from that point of view, I suppose you would just have to be a little bit cagey. But as I said, Horn is around a long time now. They're not going to get ahead of themselves and they know the test that's there in Galway. And then look, I suppose for Galway, the importance of Shane Walsh can't be ruled out. So, you know, hopefully we'll see him back flying fit. Um, you'd love to see, you know, a fully fit Galway versus Mayo just to really see what Mayo are about. And um, yeah, look, really looking forward to that game, actually. Like, you know, I definitely think it will... It'll be a lot closer, um, you know, than we think. But I would just slightly tip Mayo. I think they have a lot more positives going for them this year. Um, and, you know, they're, I suppose, without playing McLaughlin, I don't know how far away Lee Keegan is for coming back or if he if he will be back. Um, so, yeah, like, I, I, I would I would still tip Mayo, I think, Um Definitely, I think going into going into Sunday. If, like, is there a case to be made here that in the the Park Joyce regime, this is a huge game in terms of defining his era? Because some of the players you've mentioned there in this Mayo team, the really impressive performers over the last couple of years, are here for the long haul breed. Like, like I've made this point yeah. for a lot. James Horn is not here to win Connacht championships. He sees an All Ireland winning team here, but they're missing their best player. And if Galway come away with another defeat at the weekend against a Killian O'Connorless Mayo, I don't know. Would that be would that be a huge setback for for this Galway project? Um, yeah, it would be. Um, I suppose yeah, you're definitely going to see what Mayo are about. Um, Killian O'Connor, you know, out and out one of the best you know footballers in the country, and a massive blow. I think everyone you know was was a little bit taken aback to see him um, get such a significant injury and. Um, yeah, there was probably a lot of question marks a good couple of weeks back, but I think you can only beat what was put in front of you. And Mayo really played with, um, they played with finesse, they played with intensity, and and they never took the the foot off the pedal versus Leitrim. And um, yeah, I was really really impressed with them. Um, but like you say, I suppose just going in again, going in against Galway, I suppose look, Galway definitely have had a couple of areas that they needed to improve on after the Ras Common game. Um, it was a, a tough battle and probably, you know, will stand to them going into this game. Um, but I suppose there was a couple of times, you know, where Ross Common ran through ran through Galway without Galway putting a hand on him. And um while they while they are, you know, a fabulous footballing side, um, I would just be a little bit fearful from Galway point of view. But um I think look Park Choice, he is he's he's such a, a professional that he will have everything set up, um, I suppose to the best of his advantage. But I still would just, I still would just lean a little bit towards Mayo. Um, I think they, over the years, are just a lot more battle hardened. I think they have a lot of young lads now that are coming to the fore and that are really standing up. And it's not the Aidan O'Shea show in in the forwards anymore. There's a lot more people to to worry about. And yeah, defensively, I think they're a lot better set up. So um, I just think it'll make for a great game, and I'm really looking forward to it. I think this is it's brilliant to have games that you can't really call. Um, you know, I suppose we didn't have a, a brilliant championship up to now. So I think like, you know, the Ulster game is the last two weeks and and looking forward to a great um, game now up in Connacht as well. And hopefully, you know, the Munster spectacle will will be competitive as well. So, um, yeah, I suppose it looks exciting at, at this stage now to have good football to, to look forward to. The whole thing has really sparked into life over the last couple of weeks. So so hopefully this follow the trends. Um, Mayo Galway is half one Sunday and then Kerry Cork is at four o'clock. One of the fixtures that really catches the eye in the LGFA 
All Ireland this weekend is Armagh Mayo in Group One, earned their round three match. It's a two o'clock throw in yeah. uh, tomorrow. This is a cracker. They've had some brilliant matches over uh, the last couple of years as well. Breed, who's in the ascendancy in this one, and and how real are, are both of these teams' All Ireland credentials? Yeah, I suppose um, I think everyone was really excited when um, Mayo got a an influx of players back. You know, after maybe a couple of years of, of there being a little bit of of discourse there. You know, so um, it was really exciting to see. Um, you know, a, a lot of players I suppose that had a lot of experience for Mayo come back to the side. So I think people were expecting it. You know, a big resurgence in Mayo, and you know, I suppose unfortunately I don't think that they're that they're firing on all cylinders at the moment. Um, you're looking at Armagh, who, um, you know, had a, a good couple of years, at t- I suppose, tough years at senior. And I suppose last year really, you know, shone as the dark horses in the in the championship last year. Um, I think they, like, they've, they've definitely a much more balanced side and um, they're really going at teams. And I suppose last year, no more than any other year when they um, beat Mayo in the quarterfinal. So Armagh seemed to be Mayo's bogey team just over the last couple of years. They always seemed to struggle to get over the line. And last year, Armagh, I suppose, put that hoodoo to bed and got over the line versus Mayo. Um, and like they did it with such class and such style. And, and it was brilliant to see Armagh, I suppose, come from come from maybe a place where they were struggling for a good couple of years. And um, the amount of work I think that's going on in Armagh behind the scenes um, is huge. Um, so it's, it's brilliant to see. And, uh, you know, they got into a semi-final last year versus Dublin and, you know, they they took the game to Dublin. I think they only lost by five points at the end, but like it was absolutely brilliant to see. So going on farm and going on farm that Armagh have this year, um, yeah, I, I'd have to tip Armagh. I just think that they have just that little bit more um, prowess. They have a little bit more balance. Um, they're really, really playing um, with aggression and intensity and they just have that finesse up front then in, in Macken and... Um, yeah, and Carolyn Hannon and Kelly Mallon, like they just have, they just have a little bit more over Mayo, I think, at the moment. Mm. And it's a bit of a weird one as well, Brady, in that that uh, both are already through to the quarterfinal. So, like maybe it's a bit of shadow boxing. It did uh, Dublin and Cork put up big scores last weekend? Anybody to from the teams you've mentioned, and maybe you're hinting at Armagh to a degree, but anybody from the rest that you think can threaten them? Um, yeah, look, I suppose, look, there's, there's, there's 12 games up for contention across three codes this week or this weekend. Um, a couple of them are kind of do or die games, um, given that it's round three. So I suppose who you thought was going to progress from the groups, um, have progressed. And now it's a case of, I suppose, like there's, um, Meath versus Tipperary are playing as well. Um, Galway, or sorry, Donegal, Donegal versus Kerry, um, I still think probably Dublin and Cork are, are a little bit ahead of the pack. Um, I must say I'm very, very impressed with Meath um, and I have been very impressed with them, um, I suppose, over over the over the championship and over the, the end of the league. Um, they have made huge strides since they regraded in 2016. And I suppose they, you know, they're your they're your benchmark for how regrading is done and how you kind of drop down a level and rebuild and um you know, they came up to the ranks, they're a little bit battle hardened as well. And they haven't had it easy through the intermediate. You know, they've lost intermediate all Irelands and they've come through. They won an intermediate all Ireland last year. They're back, they're up senior. They won a division two final this year. So they're up division one next year. They're making huge strides. They push Cork to two points this year. So uh I'd have a little bit of um, I suppose, a tip to meet and just to see how well they get on. Um, because you know they're really exciting, and it's it's brilliant to see a new team come to the fore. Um, so yeah, I suppose my I I I just love. I'm going to keep an eye on me definitely because I think they're they're very exciting this year. Yeah, meet me Tipperary, absolutely one of the the games to watch uh, yeah. tonight. Actually, half past seven yeah. is uh, is thrown. Yeah, it's on Teach Carry. Yeah, and there's um and then the Donegal Kerry game then is on tomorrow on Teach Carry, and the other games then are streamed online on the Ladies Football Channels. Brilliant. I forgot to ask you earlier, Breed, who's going to be celebrating six o'clock in Clarny on Sunday evening? Oh God. Um I would I would love to see really, really competitive Cork. I'd love to see, I suppose, get their best men out and their best men, you know, um really playing with confidence and, and taking the game. Um I suppose I just have to lean a little bit towards Kerry from what we've seen over the last um couple of games, but I hope I'm wrong. Breed, great <laughs> stuff as ever. Thanks a million. 
No bother. Thanks a million. Good Bye. stuff. Enjoy the football. Breed stack there on the line with us looking ahead to the provincial finals in the men's football. And then there's a host of great women's football as well across the weekend, starting tonight at half past seven on the telly box as well. Right. It is quarter past nine on this Friday morning, 14 minutes past nine to be specific. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It is time coming up next for the crappy quiz. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. To me, you need your best lineup caller. So if I was picking a team, I would 100% have Ian Henderson. I think he's the best lineup caller there. At times, it's becoming farcical, and you have to really feel for these players and management. This isn't normal in any shape or form. This is not a Lions tour as we know it. I don't agree with it. I think it's the wrong decision. It's, it's harsh and Johnny Sexton, another kick in the teeth. For the best Lions coverage this summer, subscribe to the OTB Rugby podcast stream on the OTB Sports app. This is OTB Sports Radio. The pale blue dot, it's called, from, I think it was six billion kilometres away. And the Earth is this tiny, is one pixel in the photograph, blue pixel. And I think to myself, Everything that has ever existed on planet Earth is in that one pixel. So why do my little problems matter at this particular moment in time? So I, I used to adopt the same for sport. If, if something happens in a match, ah, sure, who cares? But i got to tell you, there's been moments where I have thrown that pale blue dot photo out the window. <laughs> Off the ball, Saturdays from 1 on OTB Sports Radio. Listen live on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette. Put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Chris Martin. Oh, you're kidding me. September. Kyle Lafferty. Are no! you joking me? Is that right? I know. Is that right? Uh, anybody else? Leash, was it? Like, that is one of the most stupid questions. <laughs> Darius Vassell? Seriously, you all need to just stay quiet. This is getting really annoying doing this quiz. What is going on here? <laughs> 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 Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome along to the shoutiest segment on Irish Radio. It is the scintillating, it's the stupefying, it's the splendido crappy quiz. Every Friday, we pit three of team off the ball up against each other in our no-holes-barred quiz of sporting factoids at the end of the week. Allow me to welcome today's contestants. Our first contestant today sets himself apart from casual football fans by paying close attention to the football at the Olympic Games. He knows his Anthony's from his Claudinho's, his Mateus Cunha's from his Diego Carlos's, and all the other players that sound like pro Evo footballers. Give it up for Phil the Power Egan. Did actually watch some football there? I know you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are Phil Egan. Of course you watched it. Give us your breakdown of the Olympics football so far. Well, no, in fairness, the, the games are falling at a nice time, so we can put True. them on the office, and uh, we have it all tuned in on the red button. So we watched we had Brazil and Germany on. Mm. Richarlison, obviously, showing... Uh, what he could do Anthony yeah even Danny Alves is still playing yeah um, but yeah Brazil looked good I, I thought at one stage Brazil were going to try and get the eight goals to try and uh, get some sort of revenge for that World Cup in 2014 but not to be actually turned out to be a lot closer in the end um, Spain are do, doing what they did at the, the Euros just own the ball but can't actually score goals so um, yeah it's up to, to look forward to obviously the big shock was Sweden beating the USA this is it. This is the football analysis we're getting from Phil Egan here in the Crappy Quiz every single week. We're going to, we're going to limit our Olympic soccer coverage to just the Crappy Quiz intros <laughs> and Phil will break it down every week. Our next contestant today is almost finished his six-day bender in celebration of Mead's shockingly narrow defeat to Dublin last weekend. It's a day of drinking for every point in the difference. And if they didn't go drinking for 21 days straight last year, they might have got even closer this year. Give it up for the Mead Hill Billy Tommy Rooney. Hey folks, all true. You're very welcome back. A great day for me last weekend. Nice to be called back. I don't know why I got benched. But you, it's nice to be you back. You took holidays. A bit of time out. You took holidays and then you don't get to call up after you come back. You got to work. You got to work your way back to form after yeah. coming back from holidays. You see, uh, our last contestant today was delighted to be in Croke Park last Saturday night at around five p.m. The phone coverage was good and his headphones worked perfectly as he managed to watch the Lions smash the Stormers on his phone while his family watched West Mead or someone win the Joe McDonough Cup. It's Adrian. Who's your daddy, Barry? Yeah. Great win, Owen. Take take everything we can get over Kerry, particularly. Yeah, Stor- Stormers fan here as well, licking my wounds. As ever, the format <laughs> is the classic crappy quiz with a series of questions and a range of themes. Then it's onto the slip and slide of trivia, which is the rapid fire round. You can podcast the crappy quiz on otbsports.com or on the OTB Sports app. Round one is the boring questions round. Never multiple choice. Phil, first question for you: 
Can you name the youngest manager set to man- manage in the Premier League next season? Ooh. Is it Patrick Vieira? It's not. It's Chisco. Munoz. Watford manager. Watford manager, Ooh. yeah. How close that was, was that? That uh, was tough. That was tough. Five years. Vieira, 45. Uh, he's only 40. Ah, yeah, um, it wasn't even. It wasn't close. <laughs> uh, but I saw Vieira. I'd kind of actually forgotten that Vieira was appointed manager when I, when I was going through these. There's a lot of a uh, lot of new managers. It seems more so than 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 usual actually going into next season. Uh, Tommy, who was the last Kerry manager to lose to Cork and Killarney in the championship? Was it um, Dennis Ogimorn? Correct. Tommy Rooney Oof. is off the mark. Good answer. Mm. 1995. Uh, next question for you, Adrian. Who was the last scrum half not called Conor Murray to start a test match at nine for the British and Irish Lions? Ben Youngs? No. Apparently Mike Phillips, was it? Mike Phillips, 2013. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's good. I thought I was going to say Ben Youngs as well. Round the Royals are back. Yeah, they are. Tommy Rooney, the only one who scored in round one. Round two is the Olympics odd one out round. In this round, I'm going to give you a list of three Olympians and all you got to do is pick the odd one out from the criteria I give you. Phil, which of the following boxers is a gold medal winner at the Olympics? Joe Frazier, Floyd Mayweather or Evander Holyfield? So one of the three has won a gold medal. What, what's Tommy laughing at? It just, I'm so confused. Yeah. <laughs> That's not just me, Tommy. That's why I asked. Which one of those? Which one of those <laughs> did win a gold medal at the Olympics? Okay. Was it, was it Joe Frazier, Floyd Mayweather, or Evander Holyfield? Sorry, sorry for the confusion. Oh, like Mayweather seems obvious, but I for some reason I don't think he won gold. I I think it was Evander Holyfield. No. It's not. It's Joe Frazier. Frazier won gold in 1964. Mayweather won bronze in 96 and Holyfield also won bronze in 84. See, I wasn't sure if the Mayweather bronze was as famous as like Roy Jones Jr. or something like that. And, uh, the thought, robbery. Yeah, I thought that, um, I thought, thought I was leading you down the garden path with a very easy question there, but not to be. Uh, Tommy, which of the following footballers have not won gold at the Olympics? Was A, Ronaldo, Brazil Ronaldo. B, Samuel Eto'o. Or C, Lionel Messi. So which of those have not won gold? Ronaldo, Messi. Eto'o or Messi? Messi? Messi. No, not correct. Huh? Uh, but he's only won his first proper trophy for Argentina there last week. No, he won, he won gold in 2008. Ah, sure, why? Proper why trophy. Make proper, like he just, you, don't, you get a medal, America. not a trophy. Do, do you get a trophy for the Olympics, Phil? No. No, it's just a medal. Just a gold medal. Oh, that threw me. So who was it, Ronaldo? Ronaldo, yeah, he won bronze ah. in 96 wearing Ronaldinho on his back at one stage in that tournament because there was some oh. issue with the jerseys. Uh, or sorry, there was another person called Ronaldo in the, in the team. Ronaldo, yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry, good point. Uh, Eto'o won gold in 2000, Messi won gold in 2008. Um, you you started debating with yourself over the you were thrown by the variety of prize at the end of the tournament. <laughs> 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 oh, that was a trophy. Oh, it was only a medal. Okay. Uh, Adrian. Which of the following people, uh, as notable for their life out of sport as much as their life in sport, have not got an Olympic medal of any colour? So which of these has never won an Olympic medal? Jesus, what is... <laughs> I can't even understand the question. Go on. A, the Winkle... The Winkle... The Winkle... The Winkle Voss twins. <laughs> the, a, a, the Winkle Voss twins. B, Caitlyn Jenner. Or C, Zara Tyndall. So which of those never won an Olympic medal? They're all Olympians. <laughs> Two of them. Caitlyn Jenner is a. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, Caitlyn Jenner. Yeah. And who, so Caitlyn Jenner. Who was the last the, one you said? Zara the, Tindall. The Win- Zara Tindall and the Winklevoss. The Winklevoss twins from the Social Network. Who the Army Hammer? The Winklevoss. So, you know the Winklevoss okay. boys. You don't know. Have you not? Have you not, fa- have you not seen the Social famous. Network? You not familiar. What was the question? Whether they competed Carlo, Carlo, or whether they met? Medal- which of those? Medal. Which of Very those? Good com- athletes, the Winkle boys. They, they all competed. Which of those didn't win a medal? <laughs> <laughs> um, word. It's got to be the. No, no, that's too oh. obvious. I've got to go with Zara Phillips. No, you were right. You're right. The Winkle- Not the Winklevoss. It is the Winklevoss twins. Oh, 
Uh, they're rowers, weren't they? No they were yeah, rowers. rowers. They came uh, sixth in the men's pair in 2008. Jenner won the Decathlon in 1976. 1976 was the also the games that Princess Anne took part in and her daughter Zara uh, won silver in 2012 in event. So no one scored any points in that round. Hmm. Round three is the Ivan Etniage Olympics edition round. And this round, I'll play the voice of one of Ireland's athletes at the 2020 Games in Tokyo. The only problem is it'll be played backwards. Give me the correct answer and you score one point. Phil, who is this Olympian? What do you think? At least you know where he's from. <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> I no, have... you know, you know what province he's from. Not really, no. Um, oh, I know. I I think it sounds like it's one of the O'Donovans. So, Paul O'Donovan. Let's have a listen. Tours in the morning, go away, go to college or whatever, right. go to sleep in Nana's house and she'd make us some soup and brown cake and then we'd go back in the evening then and, and do a bit of more, you know? And she's just so much love and passion and everything like and she's just happy, like even if you weren't one, she'd be, she'd be delighted with us. So. Yeah. Correct. So uh, Paul O'Donovan no. is the correct answer to that one. Tommy. So it wasn't an Ulster accent. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Tommy, uh, can you name this Olympian? What are you thinking? I'm thinking by the staccato nature that's a Dublin accent, so I'm going to say Kelly Harrington. I was thinking like this time last week, like, that was actually, I was, that was actually quite getting easy, up to weigh in to box in the World Championship final, like and. This today I'm driving into work like yeah. and I just it just started to dawn on me like I am actually like the world champion. Yeah, yeah, good Hopefully stuff. Give it away. This is actually uh, it's actually relatively easy compared to our other Ivan Etni Aj rounds, and I'm sure Adrian you'll make this a full house if you can tell me mm. who this Olympian is. It is easy. No, the other two were. I got both of the other two. <laughs> they were. They were very easy. That one's not. Not that easy. Tom Barr. No. I was Reese McLennan, wasn't it? Let's have a listen. The Queen of Love Island for a reason. Sure. Okay. But you need to be realistic about the situation. Oh. She lives in the UK. Every you brand know, wants to work, oh work with her, God. every event wants her there. Of course, yeah, it deserves Greg all of Roche, it. Like it was... And I decided to come back to Ireland and do my thing here. Not Trying unlike Tom Barrett, the seven team. Yeah, he's got, they've got relatively hey. similar voices, I guess. Like, they're both Irish male. So... Thank God he did his thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's at so the Olympics now. He's at the Olympics now, exactly, yeah. So, uh, Greg O'Shea was the correct answer to that. Tommy, you're on two points. Phil, you're on one point. Adrian, you're on nothing. We move on to round four which is the fun free magic number round. Contestants get three points for getting the number exactly right. If no one manages that, the nearest contestant who doesn't go bust gets two points. The second closest gets one point. I'm going to state that we can only accept the answer that's written on your paper and put your pens down once the music ends. So if you don't mind, give us the following number. The number of consecutive games the United States women's soccer team had gone unbeaten before their defeat to Sweden on Wednesday. Plus the number of Limerick men in the 2020 All-Star Hurling Team of the Year plus the number of NBA championships the Milwaukee Bucks have now won after this week's finals series win, plus the number of times Italy have won the Euros. Your 30 seconds expire when Sinatra sings Bright Shiny Beads. It's a tough one this week. I will admit this that. is going to be... I nearly gave away the first answer when I talked about the thing earlier on. Oh, yeah. Well, if you know that, they, they were on a massive run to the United States women's soccer team before they lost What, what was that first question? How what? many games of an unbeaten run were they on before they lost... The number, of, the, yeah, the number of Limerick men in the 2020 All-Star team. How many NBA rings, not rings, how many championships do the Bucks have and then how many times have Italy won the Euros? Adrian? I've written 19, but I'm going to give an answer of 20. Oh, you can't do that. Tommy, no, I can. Tommy, what have you put down? my answer is 20. the answer that's written on your page. 20 is Tom, my answer. Tommy, what have you put down? 38, because I bought into Youth Voice saying it was a massive number of games. 38. 38. Phil? Uh, 55. 
55. Phil's closest. It's 57. Oh, oh, oh. Jesus Christ. Close. <laughs> Phil gets two. Tommy gets one. Uh, it was 44 games. The unbeaten oh, the streak. streak. Incredible. Oh, I had 24. I was close. Uh, I had six. The numbers. <laughs> there were... <laughs> There were nine Limerick men in last year's All-Star Hurling Team of the Year. The Bucks have won the NBA Finals twice, 1971 and 2021. And, and twice. Italy have won twice. the Euros twice, 68 yeah. and that. 2021. I, I actually had nine, but I said, you know what? I could, I'm not sure about the Bucks, so I'll take down the nine and I'll put in seven just to be safe because that would have been Ooh. heartbreaking to bust myself there. No, it, you would have got it spot on if you did that. I know, but I, I was in my head I was thinking I could bust it. Okay, okay. Okay, we are on to the final. Our winner tonight will be decided in the round that separates the men from the boys, the Kyle Hayes from the Kyle Lowry's. It's an O team in particular, ridiculously easy rapid fire round. The score you get in this round will be added to your score in the previous round, and there will be 40 seconds for everyone to answer from the same set of questions. We're going to start with the person with the highest number of points, which is Phil, because we tossed the coin before coming on air, and his three points outweighs Tommy's points, who's in no second place, and then at the Adrian, who's on last. I don't make the rules, the coin does. So if, uh, what's the scores going into the last round? Three, three. Phil. Okay, so we, which one is going to be the one that trips me over, Tommy? The first question or the second one? Uh, if you get the a first question, one, you got to go. We're I, under time pressure. We got to get going. If you get a question correct, I'll ask you another question and keep asking you questions until you get a question wrong. And once you get a question wrong, and move on to the next person. And your correct answer means a deduction of one point. Phil Egan, are you ready? Yeah. Your forty seconds starts now. Which city will host the twenty thirty two Olympics? Brisbane. Correct. Name the Springboks head coach. Uh, Jack Neal. Oh. Correct. Who is leading the drivers' championship in Formula One overall this season? Max Verstappen. Correct. Name the tournament Seamus Power won last week. Uh, the Barbasol. Correct. Who knocked Kevin out of the twenty twenty football championship? Uh, Dublin. Correct. Did Mo Farah make his Olympics debut in 08 or 2012? 08. Correct. The San Mamman Stadium is the home of which team? Uh, Athletic Bilbao. Correct. Who is the Celtic manager? Uh, Andrew Postacoglu. Correct. Name the Women's Six Nations champion? England. Correct. In what country was Sunita Puspure born? Lithuania. No, it's Latvia. What? And we're out of questions. You let yourself do We are out of no. questions. No, I'm sorry, Sunita. <laughs> And you were we didn't run out of time. You ran out one, of uh, one of the most, uh, one of the most uh, brilliant rounds. Uh, I actually, yeah, like I mean, it's uh, born Riga, Lafia, uh, oh, Phil Egan. Congratulations! Nice. Very quick victory speech. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm very sorry to Sunita because I, I was, yeah, I got that badly wrong. <laughs> It leaves a sour taste. It does, yeah. At the it's end like of look, in a goal look at the just draw, the end. Phil. Look at the draw. You're like Dublin in the Leinster Championship. Look at the draw. That's what that is. No moral victory for me. We are completely out of time, but well done to Phil. Commiserations, Tommy, and sorry to you too, Adrian. Thank you for being with us here on the Crappy Quiz. We'll be with you again next week. And that is it from us here on OTB AM as well. Thanks for being with us. Eden, it's Richie McCormick here with you and our coverage of the Lions Tour is brought to you in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions and I'm happy to say joining us on the line to look ahead to this test series with the Springboks starting tomorrow evening and you can hear it live and in full with this man on co-commentary indeed is four-time Lion Brian O'Driscoll. Brian, you're very welcome back to the show. Hi Richie, how are you? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. Delving into your own experience if we can do first, Brian, these last 24 hours or so before a first test, no matter the opposition, what was your head like? How we, how did you busy yourself? What was the kind of atmosphere around the camp? I think it all really depends on the timeline of your career. Um, you know, what part of the curve you're on. You know, if you're early into um, becoming an international, and then all of a sudden you're catapulted into the Lions, which you know was pretty much the case with me. Um, towards like 21, tw- might be 22. Um, you're still learning the way and, and finding your routine and, and working out uh, what works for you. We were also going through a real um, process of understanding what the expectation was of us. So it felt those you know, formative years of professionalism were such a steep learning curve and things probably changed over the course of that period of time. Like in the early days with Ireland, we used to have pizzas delivered in on a Friday night uh, from like Domino's or from Four Star or wherever you could get a pizza locally. And we'd all go up to uh, Paddy O'Reilly, our bagman's room, and we'd all have, you know, two or three or four slices of Coke. You might wash it down with an old glass of Coke as well, um, you, know, at, you know, for good measure. Um, until it, it kind of dawned on us that, you know, the, the external factor of bringing these pizza in, pizzas in could... Um, 
you know, everyone could get food poisoning as a collective. It wasn't because it was bad nutrition. It was just that we don't want everyone to go down because of eating the same thing and we couldn't control that outside environment. Yeah. So to think about that happening in the early days to where they are now. Now, at the same time, I remember on Lions tours on Friday nights, we used to get chocolate biscuit cake because you used to realize how many calories you're going to burn three and a half thousand calories probably over the course of, of a game so there's no harm in getting having something to look forward to the night before the game as well so that used to be a little treat that replaced the pizzas but um i think as a as an individual you find what works for you um you know it's it's about getting the captain's um you know, captain's run done early in the morning on the Friday and then just trying to relax. Um, it's all about recovery, you know, making sure you, um, you know, if, if cold baths your thing to go and do them, making sure you're getting your massage, you're booked in with the masseuse for later on in the evening. Um, I like to do another little bit of analysis uh, on the opposition just to make sure that all that information was fresh in my head. So I used to do that after dinner. Um, with one of the analysts and, and sit down for the guts of an hour and go through the individual player profiles to know you know what their you know favorite foot was to step off what their favorite arm carry was whether it was a bumper fend or a straight fend whether they were all about the outside break or whether they liked to chop back in off of, off of particular foot so all of those that information you plugged into your server and and it came it came to you as you were out on the park that it became second nature as you almost understanding exactly what was going to happen before it did in real time so all those little micro moments build up over the course of the week to allow you to have your best performance on a, on a Saturday evening and then it was just trying to be nice and chilled and, and relaxed and um, you know cleaning your boots was a big part of it oh, and yeah? um, in, in Irish setup yeah going up to Paddy O'Reilly's room or Bagman Ralla and um, going up there and changing studs if that's what you needed changing laces he had everything laid out anything you could possibly imagine you might need um, so we go in there and, and, and that was more it, more it's more of an experiential piece and just a you know, a calming influence and just a, a routine to get into to try and kill an hour and, you know, you chew the fat with him. And I think that, you know, they, that's still been happening, obviously, on Lions stores. I think the English guys and the Welsh guys thought it very odd that this was a routine that the Irish boys brought in. But um, but I think, you know, they, they took it on themselves and you used to see them regularly arriving in the night before games, even though it wasn't in their you know, usual pre-match routine. It seems like the last thing you wanted to do then was in, in any way, shape or form was to keep the brain idle. Yeah, I like and I mean, you know, it's an individual thing, really, yeah. isn't it? Because some people will have played the game over in their heads. Some people will have uh, visualized exactly what they're going to do. That was never really my thing. I, I would have understood and focused on that out on the training ground, but I hated playing the game in advance of it. And um, I, I was more of, I guess, I was more of an instinctive player that I was able to switch in and switch out of of kind of um, the right mental state to be in when you're uh, when when the ball is in play or when you're away from the pitch and when you're there to relax and you're there to chill out and and like i said the video analysis piece you got to plug yourself back in again even though you're not on the training park it's um you know different you're using a different part of your brain to to make sure that you're focused and you're you're soaking up all that information that's being provided to make sure that you can put it to good use the next day um, but it's it's really just about you know trying to get yourself into as much of a relaxed state as you possibly can, um, and you know tire yourself out a little bit without doing a whole lot to make sure that you know you're not um, you know counting sheep when you do put your head to the pillow. Yeah, of course. Um, looking ahead to the game itself tomorrow evening, um, Warren Gatland obviously brought forward his uh, team selection that was probably brought about because of the leak. Uh, to the Times during midweek. Um, what was your initial reaction to that, well, match day 23, I guess, and has it altered since? Um, yeah, I, I have to say, you know, the, the pack, I think, almost selected itself, maybe with the exception of, of seeing Jack Conan in there. doesn't mean I, I'm, I'm delighted for him, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's one on merit. Um, and Gatlin's talked about that. It's, he's gone on good instinct this week. Um, and you know, maybe ordinarily before the tour, you might have thought that Toby Falatau would be the number eight in the first Test match, but it, it hasn't transpired. Jack Cohn has been very good; he's taken his opportunity, and likewise, I guess Toby Falatau hasn't quite done so. Um, and he's and he's picked on uh, Jack's ability to give 
them, you know, that essential go forward, those hard yards, and he's one of the better ball carriers in, in Britain and Ireland. So expect a, a big display in, in that regard from him tomorrow. The rest of that pack, to be honest with you, maybe Luke Cowan Dickey at the start, you might have thought Jamie George, but over the course of, of the tour, I think Luke Cowan Dickey has made the, the number two jersey his own with some really top quality performances. Um, you know, his, his play in the loose has been exceptional, stealing, pilfering so much ball. But his darts have been good. His general ball carrying has been good. He looks fit. He's obviously the English now, num now the English number one. So we shouldn't be shocked. Mm. Um, but it's it, it looks like a pack that you know you you might have considered being uh, very close to it at the start of the tour. A couple of changes in the back line. Um, I, I I don't know um, if. Many people would have had, many people outside of Scotland, I should say, would have had Ali Price as the starting scrum half um, on uh, going into the tour. Um, do you know what? I, I, it really depends on what sort of game they're planning and playing. Gatlin's talking about him being selected on the back of, of you know, him being a better running scrum half. Well, that's fine if they run the ball, but I, I have a feeling that there's going to be a hell of a lot of kicking in this game as well. And I do know that Conor Murray is a better box kicker than Ali Price, a better defensive player, albeit Ali Price has probably taken his opportunities a little bit better, shown a little bit more against weaker opposition. So if I was Conor Murray, considering being named um, your tour captain in, in Alan Wynne Jones' absence and then finding himself on the bench, you, you wouldn't be overly happy, but he, he'll have a big impact to play in, in the game nonetheless. Um, and yeah, bigger, obvious choice. And then the centre pairing of, of Henshaw and, and Daly. You know, Gatlin really set a stall out early with Daly, didn't he? Picking yeah. him three times at outside centre. So it was no shock to, to, um, to see him uh, in that jersey because Owen Farrell's form has been pretty patchy. Um, and and Robbie Henshaw has had you know a solid couple of performances, but you know earned his position on the back of some outstanding um, form in the in the Six Nations. I think that um, that centre pairing is is potentially exciting. Albeit, I do think Elliot Daly's being selected as much for his left foot, if if not more than his than his ball playing ability. So we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. Like that's an interesting thing about the, because we've heard Ronan was talking about the the presence of left footers in there too uh, last night on the show. He also brought up that point that it's probably going to be a kick fest tomorrow evening. Um, the suggestion then that you're saying that Ali Price is in there because offensively he might be a bit better than, than Conor Murray at the moment and certainly with Elliot Daly's ability to play on the wing and his go forward ball coming through the centre does that suggest that to you that the Lions are kind of happy for this talk of a kicking game to be going out into the ether whereas in actual fact they've got plans for something rather different I, I, I guess it's very hard for them to go and sorry. There's a few things. So some of the the way the tries they've scored and um, you know the play they've been able to manufacture against some of the opposition would undoubtedly give them an inflated view as to maybe where they would be um, versus a, against proper opposition. Now we got a sense of that in the Australia or in the South African A game as to what to expect this weekend. It's going to be very, very different. It's going to be incredibly attritional. There's going to be much less space than those provincial games. So what do you have to do? You've got to try and, you know, when you run out of ideas or where you're getting smothered defence, which this South African defence is, you've got to go to the air. You've got to go to the cross kick where it still can be an attacking weapon, mm. but you have to think outside the box a little bit rather than just feeling as though it'll ball, be ball in hand and playing a possession game. I think there'll be a huge amount of kicking. And that's, I guess, wh why I'm a bit surprised that Liam Williams hasn't found himself in, on the left wing instead of Van der Merwe. Um, I think that is, you know, besides the fact that he's matched up against Cheslin Colby, I think, and I said it before the tour, I, I am nervous around Van der Merwe's understanding of dis defensive systems and um, and being able to read play in, in, in real time. And, and we're talking about arguably the best player in the world at the moment in Cheslin Colby. He could make anyone look silly. Yeah. I'm not worried about him missing tackles. I'm worried about him missing reads of understanding who his personnel are and that can be catastrophic versus scramble being able to make up for a missed challenge. I think if you pick the wrong guy, that often leads to line breaks and good sides put them away. So I, I, I'll be watching with, with real interest as to how Van der Merver manages to um to deal um without without the ball 
you know, considering what's going to be coming at him. Can I ask you to expand on that a little bit? What makes you so nervous about his defensive capabilities? I, I just watched him against Ireland. I don't think he. I, I don't think it's the part of his game that is is really natural to him. This guy's a, is a really good athlete. He's mm. strong and abrasive and carries really hard. But it, you know, some guys are are like that and are, are able to manage an international level, but can just get cut out at the very highest level. Whereas you need to be a ball player. You need to understand and read the game extremely well. And I don't think that is his strength. I think comparatively, someone like Liam Williams reads the game brilliantly. I think. Watson is probably a, you know a, a combination of the two. He's this phenomenal athlete, but still reads the game quite well, and that's why I'd have had Liam Williams in there. If if it is going to be a little bit of a kick fest, and the ball is going to come down his throat as well, very good, um, very good in the air. You know, I, I think he's a, uh, on his, his Twitter bio is a self-professed um, bomb de- um, ex- bomb bomb diffuser. Um, so thank you. Um, <laughs> And so he's, you know, he's he is great in the air, and he gives you huge um, confidence with that. But he's, um, but he's sitting on the pe- on the bench now, and um, and Faf de Klerk and Pollard will be pinging those corners, and will go and go to the air. And um, Mapimbi's decent in the air; he's a big guy. Colby, you know, he, even though he's diminutive in size, is has you know phenomenal spring, and will get up and challenge. Um, they even use him for some of the kickoffs. So it just shows his capability of catching ball up above his head and, and getting up above bigger men. So I do think that um, that it's it's a strange decision, and there, there feels like there's a fair bit of Gregor Townsend in 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 one or two of those. Yeah, the the actual team selection itself as as a whole, like that there is that line that went about that Gatlin said this was the hardest team selection he's had in his entire career. There's the other part of that, which was that all of the coaching team came in on Monday with entirely different match day 23s to one another. Nobody came away with, I don't think, anything close to what they'd gone in with in terms of their um, their, their their 23. That, to me, suggests that they're all seeing something either slightly different on the training pitch from the players. They're seeing something slightly different from the outings that they've had so far or that they view South Africa differently. I, I'm not asking for everybody to be yes men in all this, but you would think that there would be some element of cohesion among the coaching staff as regards what they've seen so far. Yeah, it would be it would be a bit of a concern, wouldn't it, that they are seeing things very differently, and 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 I'm sure in some cases they are promoting their own. You can't shoot them for that. I I I, I do think that that's you know human instinct to to work with guys that you've worked with previously. It happened with Joe Schmidt. When he came into the Irish job, that he picked an awful lot of Leinster players initially because he had confidence with them, he had won with them, and he knew what they could deliver. And particularly on the individuals, say for instance in Gregor Townsend's case, the guys that he hasn't, um, you know, trained before or hasn't had a, a squad involvement with before outside of Scotland, if you didn't impress him immediately. You know, his natural instinct would be revert back to the guys that he does know that it did a job for him in the Six Nations and big wins against England and France. Um, so, it, you know, it does. You, you need that in any team selection in the Lions. You need guys going in to bat for you. And, you know, from a, from, I guess from an Irish perspective, you know, Robin McBride is there at, you know, at Leinster, but is he fighting uh, tooth and nail for certain personnel to to be getting in and uh, ahead of others I, I i don't know but it does feel as though you know certain guys i'm not saying they have an agenda i'm just saying that they see things differently and and are putting their their point across and the fact that you know it's a massively different team across the board from the ones that each of the individual coaches would have selected you know make you think that you know, is there going to be the cohesion that is necessitated to play a test match? I, I, I'd be, I'd be nervous around that. Yeah, and the cohesion thing is, is something else. When we bring in, uh, there was a brilliant graphic uh, in today's Independent. Uh, Rory O'Connor put it together about the combinations that have played so far together on this Lions tour, and the only previous experience of a combination that will be starting tomorrow. Uh, that they've had so far in this tour among the what one two three four five six games uh, was Elliot Daly and Robbie Henshaw in the centre. Like everything else is new, brand new. Like there's a there's a brand new uh, front row. Uh, granted, Luke and Dickie and Ty Furlong played together against the Stormers, 
but other than that it's been one of that three playing in the games we've seen Maro Otoje and Alan Wynne Jones obviously play together in 2017 I don't think the fear factor will be there with them necessarily but there is that question mark over the half backs with Bigger and Price uh, there is that question mark over a back three that hasn't played together at all we've had two of the three play together in two matches but nothing uh, beyond that and then you have that back row as well with Jack Conan slotting into number eight uh, alongside Courtney Laws who and this this isn't unusual for him because he's mentioned before and he's mentioned it in his column this week that it happened I think four years ago whereby he wasn't he was only involved in one of the matches going into the first test and had to get assurances from Warren Gatlin that he was going to be okay but that lack of that lack of gel like we'd, we'd had many conversations both with yourself and, and sundry other pundits heading into this tour that say you want to get your combinations right even Gatlin would have said it himself he wants to have a look at the combinations that are going to work for a test and yes here we are with only one combination on that field having worked together before yeah it's it's surprising it does concern you I guess the one thing is that sometimes you can shrug your shoulders a little bit and say well isn't that Lions rugby and mm. that you know you have the best players in the world and and some guys will click and, and other guys won't it's just you usually have a sense of that before the first test and you know it, it is um, yeah it is surprising to hear that they haven't managed other combinations you think about the 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 um, the need for you know front row unity. Um, the second row obviously will look after itself. You know back row again maybe not as nervous. Half back I think that's a big one. And um, the fact that Ali Price hasn't um, managed to play a game or certainly start a game with with Dan Bigger um, would make me a little bit nervous for sure. We saw um, Ali Price struggling with Owen Farrell um, early on in the tour where they just couldn't get on the same page. Um, and, and it took them into the second half of, of that performance. I think it was one of the games against the Sharks um, where where they you know, finally clicked a, a little bit better than they had been, but I wouldn't say they they were um, they were fantastic. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be a nervousness around how that connect is going to work. Um, I think Henshaw and Daly I'd be less nervous around because um, they're – they both read the game very well. Um, you know, a week together in training before this um, before this game will have, have stood to them. Um, and then the back three probably less important because Stuart Hogg will have played with um, Van have. der Merva in Scotland, yeah. and then and then you know Watson is a clever footballer, and then Liam Williams has come into that environment and has has played with those before in previous Lions games. So. Yeah, the halfback one is the is the most concerning one as to who's going to really take ownership of that. And you would imagine it'll be Dan Bigger. Yeah, you're looking for a big game from him. Uh, speak to us more about Elliot Daly. Him playing at outside centre has uh, been a Warren Gatlin project, obviously, because uh, by nature and by trade, he'd be a winger. Um, you'd have a fair deal of insight of wearing that number 13 on a, on, a, on a Lions tour. Has he got the tools to make that work tomorrow and beyond? He's got this incredible speed, doesn't he, and an ability to to get somewhere an awful lot quicker, be it with ball in hand or or defensively. Um, I guess the be the question marks will be around the physicality. Can he bring that to his game? I, I don't have any of those concerns with Robbie Henshaw, um, but as as you know, brilliant some of the attributes that that Elliot Daly possesses. I, I, I guess that's the one part that I'm not fully sure on. I, I saw him falling off one or two tackles last. Last week, um, you know, a bit disappointing. And he's, he's playing against one of, you know, two of the most powerful centres around in Damien Delande and Lucanio. Um, they are big men and uncompromising and destructive going forward, very physical in defence going back too. So I think Elliot Daly will um, have to use all of his footballing ability and now some, and understanding what depth to take when in attack when to give himself time to um, to thread some of those balls through. I do, I do think, you know, looking at things and, and Vili LaRue, um, he closes the gate extremely quickly on um, on phase play, but particularly on, on first phase. And I do think that there's a great opportunity for Elliot Daly to, you know, hold enough depth, but then nudge the ball through and, and you know, give his wingers and fullback something to chase in the corner as... Um, as the the blind wing for uh, South Africa comes across and tries to mop things up, so that is something to keep an eye out for. He closed the gate because they play a, a hard four up. 
you can expose you as a fullback. Mm. Lots of fullbacks would prefer to close the gate. And when I say that, I mean by shutting the last man down. Winger plays in and then often fullback has the last man. Um, the last thing you want to do on a four up is then for the fullback to play very deep and, and invite a, someone to come on if you do get a corner. So as soon as South Africa are playing that hard four up, Vili LaRue has to come up and play hard himself. And that's where that blind winger and Bafta clerks covering in behind will be essential to them, making sure their scramble's very good if that Elliot Daly or that Robbie Henshaw nudge through um, comes into effect. Um, Henshaw's going to have a helping hand obviously in, in what Duhan van der Merve does on that side of the pitch because um, Cheslin Colby as you mentioned like he's been mentioned as, as like Ronan called him like the Messi of, of, of rugby he's, he's absolutely exceptional I've seen a couple of mentions of how to counter him like you can't necessarily uh, allow him to play with both shoulders going towards the post because he will kill you and he can you know almost snap his ankles to try and get around players what is the best way to counteract what he has to offer? Well, I'm intrigued to know who came up with these options on, on how to defend them because as of yet, I have not seen anyone in World Rugby being able to defend them um, one-on-one. It, it's a collective job against them. It's defending in threes minimum. And he is the arch poacher of identifying when a defence is um, struggling, where when they've pushed too hard. And it's quite unusual for even the best players with the best footwork in the world to have an ability um, to to step in the air the way he does. And whatever he does, he mesmerizes you with his hitch kick in the air. And it's his ability to create, um, you know, immediate speed once he hits the ground, be it, you know, going the same direction or when he chops off either right or left foot with equal comfort. And we saw that against Owen Farrell in the World Cup final where it looks as though he's going to be burnt on the outside. And then that, that phenomenal um, right foot chop but then not losing an inch of speed his acceleration is phenomenal um, and you th- you know, that's the thing you wait for, for a fraction of a second for one of those steps to come and he just gasses you on the on the outside as we saw in the in the South African A game against Chris, uh, against Harris which is who's one of the, the best defenders around at the, uh, at the moment so he, he is absolutely undefendable if you're going to do it in ones and twos it's a it's a collective and a team role and um and if he gets one-on-one opportunities particularly with his offloading game if he doesn't make create the scores you know for himself he'll create them for others as he did for, with Lucanio am as well in that in that south african a game yeah uh, do you buy much uh, of gatlin's talk that they dented the spring box ego in some of the things that they did in that a game it seems to be something that I'd, I'm not necessarily if, if I'm a head coach of uh, you know the opposition uh, I, I'd love to hear that kind of stuff because that's the stuff that would light a fire under your players necessarily like that's it's it's not atypical of, of Warren Gatland but I'm, I'm not sure it would have full grounding in what we saw against that Springbok case yeah I, I, I think that they're that's probably a little bit misplaced because if you look, if you look at them you know, not conceding when they were down to 13, when the Lions just hammered away at their line just before half time. Yes, they did eventually get across with the pick and pick and jam, but you know, South Africans have huge pride in their goal line defence, and they defend it like um, their life is is on the line. And it's it's almost a slur on their personality if if you do manage to cry, cross the whitewash um, when they're giving it their all and. You know, this team's World Cup success was built on a suffocating defence with a great kicking game, and they are not going to change anything. They are going to be in the Lions' faces. They're going to give them no time to play because I do feel as though the creativity in the Lions is significantly greater than in in South Africa. But yet the one-on-one ability of uh, the likes of Colby, of Mpimpi, is better if, you know, better than most of the Lions, maybe with the exception of of Watson, who can who can do some fantastic things as an individual, but um, I, I I do feel as though they're, we're going to get they're going to be Ron Seal. We're going to we're going to get what it says on the tin, and they're not going to change anything. It's going to be ferociously physical. They're going to come around the corner, and can you match it? And if they do match, if you if you do match it, they'll go to the air. They'll look for contestables. And then that, what they'll do is they'll try to get to midfield rooks and they'll get Vili LaRue on one side and, and um, 
and uh, Pollard on the other side, and that's when they'll try and bring in their wingers with one-on-one or or even two-on-one, and they will back their wingers with the ability to be able to break those tackles, get offloads, and it'll be one, two scores. This isn't going to be a tri-fest, I don't think. This is going to be a pretty tight game with scoreboards being ticked over, with penalties being given away, um, and then a a try or two, and that will be the difference between winner and loser. We've talked massively, obviously, about the the Lions selection and you know the different people who've been left out, the people who've been included. Clearly, there's an ability to pivot and to change should things go not necessarily wrong this weekend, but if something needs tweaking, something can be tweaked, a player can be brought in, a player can be ch- uh, switched out. Whereas South Africa leans so heavily on the fact that they have this cohesion of the same, I think it's like 17 players who were involved on Saturday, played in the World Cup final um, two years ago now at this stage. Um, they've only played a couple of games since in reality they've had several of the squad in recent weeks contract COVID-19 like putting your you know crystal ball in front of you can you see that level of physicality being sustained by the Springboks throughout three successive tests in three successive weeks well the big thing the question Richie is can they do it in the first test whatever about weeks two and three but because they will be better for another game under their belt of, of match test match intensity whereas you know, with respect to Georgia, the intensity, yes, they came at them and it was great for, for a hit out, but that's not world class opposition that you're looking to, you know, build your your fitness base around. Um, they will have gotten a, a, a lot out of the South African game, those players that did play in it. But the reality is, and, and if you look back to 2009 as well, even when in the first test, when they, they got up to a 19 7 lead um, they they started to run out a little bit of puff in the last 15 minutes and I know that that's 12 years ago mm. but that feels like it's going to be all the more heightened on the back of their, their lack of game time in, in recent years since that World Cup final so for me it's a massive opportunity for the Lions if they can hold out in the first 50 minutes and not you know go behind you know more than a score I feel as though they have the fitness um, to be able to properly compete in the last 15 minutes and maybe take advantage of a, of a, a struggling um, pack of forwards, even with that bench coming off. And if you look at that front row, like it, it's arguably better than the starting front row. Um, but it does feel like um, like this, this Lions team will have engines to go 80 minutes and, and have had numerous test matches in recent months, whereas you can't dig into the well if it's not there, if you haven't built that baseline. And, and South Africa haven't done that through no fault of their own. And the reality is that they will find that last quarter of the game excruciating, particularly if the game is in the balance, because I do think the Lions have the, have the edge. And that's what makes this first test the most important from a Lions perspective. They could get one up here, it's game on. I think if they lose that first one, they could be in trouble. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors.